Good morning, everybody uh, listening on uh, on YouTube. Uh, I hope your connection is good. Uh, it's uh, it's always difficult with these seminars uh, because uh, those of us who are presenting are sitting with uh, a, a small number of images, and we we have no idea if anybody is out there or how many of you there are. But uh, welcome to this online seminar on the protection of gypsum cast. It's part of the uh, VDHK Symposium of Natura 2000 and uh, particularly features on cave protection in gypsum cast. Uh, four days of events in Germany, uh, but this symposium uh, is on uh, the world gypsum cast of the world. Uh, and then this later this afternoon, uh, a seminar on uh, cave and gypsum protection in Europe. And very sadly, uh, we are dedicating this uh, to the late Alexander Klimchuk, whose talk we were hoping to have at this symposium, but who, uh, who sadly died uh, just a, a short while ago. And uh, this is uh, one of, uh, oh, it's not advancing. There we are. No. Oh, there we are. Okay. So this is Alexander uh, as uh, uh, as I particularly will remember him on a meeting uh, in uh, in China, uh, pointing uh, always pointing out features, uh, and uh, uh, he he will be a great loss. Paolo will be later giving a, a tribute to him. My task is just to introduce evaporite cast in international protected areas. Uh, and I should have added, in fact, that I, I chair the, the World uh, Commission on Protectors Areas Cave and Cast Working Group. Uh, so my, there we go. So evaporite cast in international protected areas uh, is the theme. And uh, this is not a, sadly an international protected area, uh, but this is the area that Alexander would have uh, been talking about. Uh, this is close to the entrance to uh, Azernia Cave, uh, one of the uh, the great gypsum caves, uh, which uh, we had the, the privilege of exploring. So what I, I want to just give you are some information on the UNESCO designated sites. There are three of those, Biosphere Reserves, UNESCO Global Geoparks and World Heritage Properties. And then there are Ramsar sites. They are slightly different in that they are designated by an international convention with UNESCO as custodian. But the four are the recognized internationally designated protection at protected areas. So if we look first at the world network of biosphere reserves, there is no database. Uh, but there's a UNESCO website that provides details of each biosphere reserve by country. And we basically took the information, input it into an Excel spreadsheet uh, that currently has got 642 biosphere reserves uh, in 118 individual countries, uh, with another 20 trans transboundary biosphere reserves in 31 individual countries. So I have a spreadsheet with 662 biosphere reserves and transboundary biosphere reserves, 122 individual countries. We searched through those using cave, gypsum, limestone, and cast as keywords. In some cases, those keywords that were not present in the site description, but there were other evidence suggesting cast. Uh, so we did a, a search on the web if we found evidence, then we amended our score. The conclusion was that 151 of these biosphere reserves in 62 countries contained cast. 149 were solely in carbonate rocks, just two with both carbonate uh, and evaporite cast. Uh, Bardinas Reales in uh, Spain and uh, Yabel Buhedma in Tunisia. And so this photograph is taken uh, from, the, uh, from the UNESCO site, uh, showing one area of gypsum cast, uh, which is a biosphere reserve. 
Ramsar sites, the Ramsar Convention agreed in 1971, subsequently amended, and then in 1996, they added a specific category for a, a wetland type karst and other subterranean hydrological systems, which they divided into marine, coastal, inland and human made. They maintain a really good database of Ramsar sites, which can be downloaded. Uh, the last time I downloaded and updated it was the 1st of July last year. At that point, there were 2,439 Ramsar sites across the world, an area of over two and a half million square kilometers in 172 what they call contracting parties. Uh, that's so they don't use the word country, uh, which can be contentious. Uh, and uh, I've just picked out Sour Lake here, Ramsar site, uh, which is one of three gypsum sites. So uh, just for the convenience of the slide, I'm showing it there. Uh, same procedure, I, I put together the Excel database, I sorted it to find ZK, uh, and then that gave me 126 Ramsar sites in 55 countries. Only three include the word gypsum in the site description. Uh, and I've actually put the site description, uh, that's in italics here. So that Sour Lake I just shown is formed over limestone rock isolated by gypsum barriers. Uh, it, its water chemistry is unique, um, which makes it one of several thousand unique water chemistry sites across the world, but there we go. Uh, in Mexico, uh, we've got uh, this area, uh, which uh, area de protection, flora and fauna, uh, cuatro singigas with my appalling Spanish, but there we go. Gypsum deposits in the form of dunes, one of only three such landforms in North America. We don't know whether there are any caves in either of those areas. In Spain, uh, this Reserva Natural Lagunas de Archeodona, uh, a permanent water body uh, that receives a major part of water from an underlying cast aquifer on gypsum substrate. So this looks like gypsum cast as most of us would recognize it. Uh, maximum depth of 13.2 meters um, and extending example of karstic solution processes in the gypsum layer of the Triassic, an interesting German Andalusian deposit. Um, so, uh, so that looks a very nice site there. The UNESCO Global Geoparks, uh, no downloadable list again, but they are shown by country on a UNESCO website. Uh, I've updated that because they update these quite regularly. I had a look at that uh, just literally yesterday. Uh, at that point, there were 190 uh, across the world uh, and four transboundary in 48 countries. And again, I constructed a website, uh, an Excel spreadsheet, uh, and looked for caves or cast. Um, so as of yesterday, I found 79 geoparks in 30 countries with carbonate cast, but just three with evaporite cast. Uh, one of which is the uh, Haas, and I won't attempt to pronounce it because I'll get it wrong, uh, Global Geopark uh, in Germany. Uh, then there's Cash Island, uh, which is uh, a global geopark in Iran, that is salt. And then uh, I have to say somewhere that I'd never heard of, uh, which is a site in Romania, uh, which claims to have some of the longest and deepest salt caves in the world. Uh, also remnants of large deposits of salt and gypsum. So that looks an interesting site that uh, it would be nice to find more information on it, uh, but it's now a UNESCO global geopark. Finally, uh, we come to the World Heritage Properties. Uh, to be included, uh, the, uh, the, the site must be of outstanding universal value, uh, meet le at least one of 10 selection criteria, six being broadly cultural and four natural. As of the 1st of January, 2022, uh, 1,154 World Heritage properties in 167 state parties. Same sort of procedure, I went through the database. I've identified 75 in 43 countries, 
that contains some carbonate cast, but there is just one that has evaporite cast, uh, and that's the Wood Buffalo National Park in Canada. Uh, and this is the, the only photo I've currently been able to find. I own apology to Derek Ford because he sent me some photographs uh, and I, uh, I, I had a computer failure. I've managed to lose them uh, and I haven't been able to replace them yet. But we've got a, uh, a collapsed O-line uh, on gypsum here. Uh, but very importantly, uh, as Paolo will well know, there is also a candidate World Heritage property with superb gypsum caves and cast, which is the evaporitic cast and caves of the northern Apennines in Italy. Uh, that is under consideration at the moment. So unfortunately, we can't say any more about it, uh, but uh, uh, there is a hope that that will soon be on the World Heritage list. Even if it is, I think we can agree with this conclusion. Casts on evaporite rocks in general, and gypsum in particular, are very seriously underrepresentative in each type of international protected area. And there is clearly a need uh, to, to see more protection of gypsum cast globally. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll finish there, uh, a, a relatively short introduction, um, but it's a short introduction because there's very little to say, sadly. Um, so I'm just slightly ahead of myself, but uh, that gives us time to just check with my colleagues. Has Kyung Sik <coughs> um, uh, uh, arrived? Can anybody tell me, Bubble? I can see you, John. Okay. Ah, good. Brilliant. Sorry, Kyung Sik. When, when I started, we hadn't found you, so I, I just wasn't sure whether you're there. Well, look, uh, without further ado, then, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Kyung Sik Wu, who's chair of the uh, the, the WCPA Geoheritage Specialist Group uh, and a past chair of uh, the International Speleological Union. And he's going to be looking at uh, a new IUCN program on key geoheritage areas uh, for geoheritage conservation. So I'm going to stop my screen share now, Kyung Sik, and uh, it's over to you. Can you see my can you see my PPT? Yep, that looks good. You just need to um actually show it as a slideshow. Okay. Yep. Spot on. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, it's uh, my great pleasure to see some of the old friends, Paolo, <laughs> and uh, and Bauer, of course. And um, I'm still in the jet lag. You know, I arrived from uh, United States last night, and I'm supposed to be deep sleeping right now in United States. So you know, <laughs> um, I don't know how long I can. Uh, stay and uh, attend this meeting. Uh, I just try to be here until I really uh, have to uh, go. But uh, it's good that John uh, introduced a little bit about World Heritage and Global Geopark, the status of gypsum karst for those programs. And now I would like to uh, share some information that the uh, 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 some of some of us in IUCN WCPA Geoheritage Specialist Group uh, has been uh, pursue, pursuing uh, past a few years, and and I, these these are the contents I'm I'd like to cover. Uh, I'll try to uh, go a little bit fast. Uh, I have to cover quite a lot of contents in 30 minutes. Uh, I'd like to, uh, uh, I'd like to um, introduce a little bit about IUCN, IUCN WCPA and Geoheritage Specialist Group. Maybe some of you may not 
have heard of it. Uh, and uh, uh, this is a little basic things. That I, I try to try. I try to distinguish between uh, biodiversity, geodiversity, and geoheritage. And uh, uh, even though John uh, introduced a little bit about the UNESCO programs, uh, I'll uh, give you a little bit more introduction uh, what they are. And I'll introduce why we need a key geoheritage areas. I explain a little bit about the concept and how to make assessment and the strategic plan and the summary. IUCN is the, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. And it's not a really NGO because uh, it, it's neither NGO nor uh, intergovernmental organization. It's a very strange organization because uh, the Korean government, the Ministry of Environment, is a member. And I am a member. So they accept the membership from the state party, as well as uh, uh, the individual uh, experts or people or, or anybody you know, who wants to be uh, interested in IUC in activities. And they, uh, there are more than 160 countries uh, uh, who are the members of IUCN, and they uh, are responsible for world heritage evaluation process. And they make recommendations to UNESCO. Uh, after reviewing the, after making the field evaluation and the desk, uh, and the panel reviews, and IUCN has uh, six uh, commissions, and one of which the, is the World Commission on Protected Areas, which has, which is the largest, uh, composed of over two thousand five hundred experts. And I can say 99% are biologists and less than probably 1% is geologists, maybe a little bit more. Uh, I, uh, IUCN has been made, uh, making, uh, has adopted several resolutions dealing with uh, geoheritage and geodiversity since uh, 2008. In 2008, uh, conservation of geodiversity and geological heritage and 2012, uh, valuing and conserving geoheritage within IUCN program. And 2016, conservation of movable geoheri geological heritage. And uh, 2021, uh, um, on key geoheritage areas. Let me explain a little bit more about this resolution. This resolution encourages national member organizations, other conservation organizations, and uh, managers uh, of protected areas, and also outstanding underground sites, uh, managers of an outstanding underground sites. It's, it's, it's important that it is mentioning the un underground sites to foster geology, uh, knowledge about geodiversity and geoheritage inside and outside protected areas, and to even establish or improve national registration concerning the protection of geoheritage, and to encourage the respectful exploration and study of your underground environments and their interrelations with the surface. This resolution also calls on uh, the states and non-NGOs and universities, et cetera, to take into account the specific issues linked to underground environment in the definition and implementation of nature conservation policies, and to adopt a holistic approach to the management of underground natural environments, considering all relationships between biological and geological elements. This resolution requ requests the Director General and WCPA to mobilize the support, uh, support of national efforts, efforts to collect, compile, and publish data on geoheritage and geodiversity. And this is, the, uh, this is the important point, to support the development of a detailed study envisaging the establish establishment of a future IUCN initiative on key geoheritage areas. 
as a complement to the existing key biodiversity areas program in IUCN right now, in order to protect your heritage site of global conservation significance and move towards more integrated nature conservation. Let me explain a little bit about the GeoHeritage Specialist Group. Um, in WCPA, World Commission on Protected Areas, uh, there are several geo uh, the specialist groups, task forces, and some other, uh, other groups. And this is the only group, GeoHeritage Specialist Group is the only group uh, dealing with GeoHeritage in IUCN. This uh, uh, group was approved uh, by IUCN WCPA uh, in 2013, November 2013. And since then, uh, I have uh, chaired uh, this uh, specialist group almost 10 years. You know, it's, uh, somebody may tell me uh, I'm dictating this. Uh, uh, group, but uh, it's been 10 years, you know. Um, and this is a GSG structure, and we have uh, six uh, deputy chairs, and uh, you can see John Gunn, who just uh, made a speech, uh, and he's the chair of the Cave and Karst Working Group. And uh, we have six uh, regional vice chairs from New Europe, North America, Oceania, Arabic countries, and Africa, Asia, and South America. And we have uh, some other experts in our steering, uh, steering committee uh, members uh, as a thematic advisory group and invited organization representative members. So from ProGeo, from UNESCO, uh, Global Geopark Network, UIS, and IAG, and IUGS. And uh, Tim Badman, who is the director of the World, uh, World Heritage Program in, in IUCN, he is uh, a focal point uh, in IUCN for this uh, specialist, specialist group. And in our specialist group, there are uh, two uh, working groups. And uh, uh, Caves and Karst Working Group used to be a, a separate specialist group, and uh, somehow, uh, the, this working group uh, was merged to, into GSG uh, several years ago, and uh, I asked John to uh, take a lead on, for this group. And uh, last year, uh, we a uh, new working group was uh, set up, the Geoconservation and Climate Change Working Group, and there are two ladies who are uh, leading this group. Uh, Wesley here and Sudet Kimber from the United States. Let me, uh, this, 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 uh, kind of, this, these are a little bit too basic, but when we talk about nature conservation, we, not we, you know, when we, when, uh, when uh, most people talk about nature conservation, uh, we usually uh, think that it's ecosystem or biodiversity. And uh, there are there is a very clear distinction between biodiversity and geodiversity, I think. And uh, biodiversity is an, uh, represents the, an ecosystem of healthy evolution. And within the ecosystem, there is a strong interconnection of different flora and fauna, of course. There may be some uh, relationship between biodiversity and geodiversity. High diversity area, high biodiversity area is commonly associated with various substrates, meaning high geodiversity. But when we talk about the geodiversity alone, it simply means presence of different geological elements. And they are not interconnected each other. You can see many different elements, geological elements, but you know the spirithems do not really uh, have lot with these trilobite fossils. You know, so, so they are not really interconnected. But high geodiversity may mean high potential education values. 
but it does not necessarily imply high conservation values. We all know that geology is the history of the earth. And uh, the physical geology is, uh, is uh, the, the physical, uh, physical nature uh, of, the, of the earth. And uh, when we talk about geomorphology, we are talking about present landforms and landscape and ongoing processes. Well, I can say it's uh, all geology as a whole. Geology also uh, has some contents on historical geology, uh, meaning evolution of life forms uh, since uh, 3.8 billion years ago. So, Considering all that, geo, we can say geoheritage comprises the elements of the Earth geodiversity that are considered to have significant value for intrinsic, scientific, educational, cultural, aesthetic, and ecological regions, and therefore deserving conservation for the benefit of for the benefit of future generations. Geoheritage site can be a huge area, maybe a huge mountain range or just a single mountain with some very important structural features in it, or uh, like this uh, beautiful karst features in Gunung Mulu in Borneo. But some geoheritage, significant uh, geoheritage site, maybe just a single line. This is the uh, just a single boundary between uh, Cretaceous and Tertiary boundary, we call it KT boundary. Within this boundary, there is a, a shale layer <coughs> of very abnormal iridium values. And it can tell us the whole story about the meteorite impact and the extinction of dinosaurs. But also some caves that you heritage sites. Of course, gypsum caves in Ukraine, and this uh, photo was provided by uh, Alex uh, Klimchuk in 2000 for the 2002 uh, International Cave Exposition in Samchuk. And also some gypsum flower in gypsum in limestone cave in New Zealand. The, the geoheritage site, unless it was uh, destroyed by human activities, or probably natural processes as well, but it can stay very long. It can stay very long, long, but it's non-renewable, meaning that once it's gone from the Earth's surface, it's gone forever. So it's quite different because the biodiversity ecosystem, they can, some many, most all the organisms are reproductive, but for the geological geoheritage sites, is non-renewable. So once it's gone, it's gone forever. There are many nature conservation programs and organizations. You know, the UNESCO for the Geoheritage Site, uh, the UNESCO World Heritage Program, Global Ge Geoparks that uh, uh, John Gunn just uh, described. But in IUCN or, uh, or the, the intergovernmental uh, the organizations, Nature, nature, nature conservation has been focused mostly for biodiversity and for threatened and injured, endangered species. There are three programs in UNESCO, World Heritage Site, Biosphere Reserve, and Global Geoparks. And the World Heritage Site should have outstanding universal values, which is very, very difficult to get in most cases. I'll tell you why in a minute. But global geoparks are relatively easy. Doesn't mean that it's not as good as World Heritage Site. It's a different program. Global geoparks are a fantastic program because it should have some geoheritage site of international significance, but it should promote geotourism, meaning educational tourism, as well as local sustainable development. So you need people and villages to make a global geopark, to collaborate uh, uh, with the, uh, the 
for for for, for to prom promote the uh, social economic development of the of the region and the, the geopark region. So the uh, World Heritage Site. It should have outstanding universal value, meaning the best of the best or representative of the best. It's a very subjective term, but it's very difficult because you have to be the best one in the whole world. And it's very, very difficult to, to justify. But that's not all. You need to have integrity, meaning uh, it has been conserved very, very well. And also it has some um, integrity, geological integrity. It has the story of all the geological elements. And of course, the, for the World Heritage Site, it should have ongoing management and management plan, which is very important. And I would say it should have a wow factor. Means you have to say like a, Wow, 20 times when you visit the uh, World Heritage Site. If you go to Scotian Cave and if you stand on the bridge in the Scotian Cave, you wouldn't believe there is a world like this, you know? So this was, this is, a, uh, you know, qualified as a World Heritage Site. Global geopark and geotourism concept. In old concept, uh, there are some historical site, cultural site, and traditional site and ecological site and geological site, all those uh, uh, sites has been operated separately. But the global geopark is very similar to biosphere reserve, but uh, the, they are using ge not only the geological element, but also other combined elements and use all of them uh, as a, uh, a, for tourism. So by using all of them, we need to achieve conservation and also uh, geo educational educational uh, program and socioeconomic development. But we cannot conserve small or remote geo heritage site with difficult accessibility because the geoparks, I told you geoparks should have a village and the people and the connection of people with the geo heritage site and the tourists and everything. For the world heritage site, it's, you know, it's way up there. It's very difficult to achieve. So, but there are many small or many other geo heritage sites with difficult accessibility, no villages, no people, or just, just you know, a single very important geology site uh, surrounded by nothing, you know, no, no villages or no people. Which means, can you say are all global geology sites protected? No, we need a new additional program to fill the gap. So we have to classify into different geological contexts. The geological framework is a list uh, categorized according to geological and geomorphic features of uh, geoheritage. Maybe cave is a little bit different from this uh, part because cave is not only the geological, uh, geomorphological significance, but also it has some uh, biological, uh, very high bi uh, biological uh, ecosystem values as well. Uh, of course, as well as uh, other uh, archaeologic or the anthropologic uh, um, uh, significance. How do you make assessment for geoheritage area? The key geoheritage area is strictly limit, uh, limited to geological values alone. What I mean geological value, I'm including uh, geomorphic values of, as, as well. But caves may be different, as I mentioned uh, earlier. Among similar geological sites, only the selected key areas of global significance can, must be conserved first. Thus, the evaluation of geoheritage for international geological significance is based on criteria, rarity, 
representativeness and integrity within the same geological context through comparative analysis. Meaning, if we want to uh, 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 make an assessment for the gypsum karst and cave, we have to compare with other gypsum cave and karst uh, in the whole world. Is this the, the only one? Is this the only one which has this feature? Or is this the best representative of the formation process? Something like that. So comparative analysis for KGA is uh, simply uh, is is uh, is simply uh, um, done by thorough comparative analysis with pre-existing world heritage sites in global geoparks. But sometimes, uh, for for the world heritage properties, you need to uh, compare with the uh, similar uh, the size with the similar features in all over the world. But you have to prove that what is new about this site, what is better, what is different. So you need to make a justification as a key geo heritage area uh, uh, to, to prove that this site, your heritage site, has an uh, international uh, significance. Um, this comparative analysis and the, 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 the assessment concept was very well summarized by some paper, the series of papers by Wimbledon. Comparative analysis for caves, it may be different. You know, it, it, caves cannot be evaluated only for the geological features alone. You know, some caves has a very significant uh, uh, biodiversity values. Even though it's a very small cave, you know, if there are thousands of new species in there, that can be a very key area. But remember, you should remember that those high biodiversity is based on the high geodiversity, you know, and the geological environment as well. So the geoheritage assessment to KGA. We, if you are given the geoheritage area, you need to identify the geological features. Okay, what's the significance? Is it structural geology? Is it uh, uh, is it a fluvial system, or is the cave system with the with the very complicated hydrologic system, or is this a, a special cave uh, 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 formed by uh, sulfuric acid, or etc. You know, you have to categorize and you have to choose the framework. Within the cave system, there are different, uh, there can be different framework uh, for the caves as well. And you have to select the criteria. Is it representative of a, a limestone cave formation? Is this feature unique in the whole world? And of course, the integrity. So, and then you make, have to make a comparative analysis uh, based on controlling factors uh, above this, three above, within the same context. And now you make a judgment whether it's qualified as a key geoheritage area. I drew a diagram, simple diagram, and you can see that this one, this uh, uh, light gray, is it gray or uh, yellowish uh, circle uh, is meaning international, global, or uh, what I mean regional here is, is uh, like Asian or you know African. It's, uh, uh, it's not a small reason. Uh, uh, international significance. Of course, World Heritage Site here. And this uh, blue circle means Geosite in the global geopark and national geopark. The, in the global geopark, there are some uh, geoheritage sites of international significance, but the rest of them may be just a national to local significance. Then what's happening here? We have the whole large area which remains as a gap, which can be a key geoheritage area. 
And I can say for sure that some caves are the geohistory site of international significance. Maybe Paolo may this not agree with this is not a natural cave, is it? It's a, it's a mine, but you know, I, I just included that uh, uh, because it's a fascinating site. Yeah, even though it's a mine, you know, uh, these crystal, gypsum crystals are geological features, minerals. So I think it can be a, a, a candidate for the KG heritage area as well. So the, the Geoheritage Specialist Group in IUC and WCPA will collaborate with IUGS, UNESCO, ProGeo, IGU, UIS, and uh, Global Geopark Network. And uh, uh, hopefully, we would like to this uh, uh, key geography area adopted by IUCN at the next WCC, uh, which was uh, one year later than this, you know, 2025. It was 2024, but it was postponed to 2025. So still, we have. Um, a little more than two years to uh, pursue this uh, process. So uh, summary and moving forward, a new protected area program in IUCN, key geoheritage area is proposed and it is absolutely required uh, to deliver our invaluable geoheritage heritage resources for future gener generations. The concept for this program needs to be included in the IUCN resolution at World, Head, World Conservation Congress in 2025, and the final resolution must be adopted. For this purpose, the close collaboration between WCPA, GSG, and uh, other international organizations such as IUGS, ProGeo, UIS, IAG, and others is necessary. Speleologists need to develop the evaluation, evaluation criteria for international significance of various types of cave and karst, including gypsum caves and karst. Maybe uh, it, it may be separate, you know, the limestone caves. Uh, we need to develop criteria. What's like, like the, uh, maybe this is the longest, you know, cave of the whole world. Maybe this, you know, this should be, uh, I think the longest gypsum cave is in Ukraine, right? Uh, I, I'm hoping that this it, it has been uh, survived, but you know, but uh, so you need to uh, develop a criteria for uh, to develop a criteria to make uh, justify to be justified as a key geohistory site for gypsum and karst caves. I think this is uh, my last slide. Thank you very much. And I added one more slide uh, the, uh, this morning. And this is the, 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 when I met Alexander Klimchuk in 2002 during the uh, Samcho Cave Exposition, International Exposition Cave Position. And we went on a field trip to one of the limestone cave and the, uh, Derek is behind me and look at myself, you know, I was a young, young, uh, young guy at the time, and Alex looks about the same, you know. And the last time I saw him was uh, uh, when I was elected as the UIF president uh, in Bruno Czech Republic in 2013. And I'm here, and Alex was sitting next to me. And that was the last time I saw him. And I'm very uh, sorry uh, for our loss uh, and uh, deep condolences uh, to Alex. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Jung Sik. Uh, I, I think the way that, that the, these are being organised, we're, we're not actually having specific questions after e each speaker, but you, you've gone perfectly to time and I, we're, we're pretty well exactly on our schedule. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, there's, there's a lot for us to think about there. And of course, the, there's in terms of the caves, uh, we've got uh, uh, obviously our carbonate caves and gypsum caves, but then the many lava caves as well, uh, presenting us with other challenges uh, and caves in other materials. So uh, uh, we've got a great deal to do over the next next two years. I think, John, you need to do a lot, a lot of uh, 
you, you need to make some uh, paper uh, a group for this uh, uh, task. And you may want to have separate group for uh, uh, lava cubes and you know limestone cave and gypsum cave. Maybe you can combine gypsum and halite cave. I don't know, you know. But uh, I'm I'm not sh I I don't really have a lot of information uh, how uh, on the the halite caves. You know, I know some caves in Iran or uh, some in uh, Czech. I don't know in Iran and and then the Poland. Uh, and Romania, uh, the, the, Romania. The, the Romanian one, but yeah, but that that's that's a a, a good area, and certainly, obviously, where the the gypsum and the the uh, the, the great gypsum caves as well that we have in Germany, uh, so which I'm looking forward to seeing in July. But mm. uh, let's let us move on because uh, uh, both both yourself and myself, we've we've mentioned uh, our, uh, our our great friend Alexander. And uh, I'd now like to introduce uh, Paolo Forte from uh, the University of Bologna to talk about the life and work of Alexander Klimchuk, uh, in, especially in terms of his work for the gypsum cast of the world. So uh, over to you, Paolo. Thank you. Well, thank you. Poi, well, uh, ta -ta 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 -ta. qui devo mettere eh, slideshow show from the beginning. Okay. Well, I was uh, really a lucky person because I was the first from the Occidental uh, uh, nations to have the chance to meet uh, Klim when he was uh, rather young. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, he was younger than me, uh, but uh, in a few time, we uh, became uh, really uh, sincere friends for over 40 years. And we had the possibility in these 40 years to collaborate in the field of uh, gypsum cast uh, and uh, mainly on the study of the cast because at the beginning of our knowledge uh, some 40 years ago um, gypsum cast were just uh, uh, defined as a, a poor similar things uh, to uh, 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 limestone cast and this was not the true now we know much more on this kind of cast. And this is um, just uh, uh, to uh, claim in most part because uh, he uh, pushed uh, a lot the study of, of cast, of gypsum cast. Well, the first time we met was uh, in the uh, first European conference in Sofia in 1980. Uh, and uh, Klim was uh, a young researcher and had the possibility to meet uh, Occidental uh, scientists only in that occasion, because, uh, you know, at the time, Soviet Union was uh, rather closed and few people may uh, travel uh, uh, freely uh, in other countries. In Sofia, uh, uh, we met for the first time and they immediately started talking about our common main interest, the gypsum case, because uh, we, uh, I came from uh, a region where the study of the gypsum cave started a, 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 in uh, 16th century and uh, in Soviet Union, uh, uh, in the former Soviet Union, uh, the uh, cave uh, of Podolia, the gypsum cave of Podolia, uh, are, uh, were already uh, the largest of the world. Oh, in that co <clears throat> conference, even if Klim was uh, very young, he pre uh, presented a, commun uh, a communication on conservation of cast areas uh, uh, 
uh, of uh, uh, his area. And I presented a, 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 a paper on the conservation of karstic areas uh, of uh, uh, gypsum near Bologna, Italy. Uh, uh, it was uh, evident in the time that only few people had the interest in preserving uh, nature uh, and uh, uh, even less in preserving caves because uh, uh, at the time uh, the economy uh, was much more important uh, and uh, gypsum quarries were spread all over the world. Uh, then uh, we started discussing about the genetic problem of uh, uh, Clemens uh, caves. Uh, that, uh, that these caves are, are, these caves are completely different of the other uh, until uh, the time known in the world. And this was extremely exciting for me to learn about uh, the Podolia caves and the possible genesis of, 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 of them. And for this reason, I immediately decided uh, that I had to visit them. Or oh, a few years later, we started uh, to meet uh, on a regular basis because I uh, became uh, president of the physical chemistry and the hydrogeology uh, commission of the UAS. And uh, uh, Klim uh, was a member of, of this commission so that uh, we had the possibility uh, to meet uh, on a regular basis about uh, once a year uh, in some of the uh, countries uh, uh, above uh, the um, uh, Iron Curtain. And uh, we increase a lot our exchange by letter and later by email. Well, finally in uh, uh, 87, uh, Alexander was able to invite me to visit uh, Podolia uh, and the uh, astonishing cave uh, uh, there. You can see here uh, and Andrejczuk, uh, the friend of Klimchuk, and here Klim inside the Loska cave. This uh, photo uh, well, uh, I, I took uh, during a trip uh, in the Lost that lasted more than six hours. And we discussed a lot about the different minerals uh, we found uh, uh, there inside. And, and uh, I think three or four years later, I had the possibility to guest uh, Klim to visit uh, our gypsy in Emilia Romagna, uh, and he had the chance to see uh, caves, a gypsum cave completely different from that uh, he has explored uh, in, in his country. Well, he was really one of the pioneers in the exploration and study of the gigantic gypsum cave in Podolia. Uh, but uh, he immediately uh, uh, make also uh, uh, documentation uh, of these caves and uh, firstly uh, had the idea uh, to see that the genesis of this cave was completely different, uh, different from any other kind of uh, um, uh, theory of, of, of the time. Uh, he recognized that the water creating uh, the Optimicheskaya, Ozernaya, uh, and other caves of there ca came from the depth, so that uh, uh, the morphology of these caves are completely different of those of, of the other cave. Uh, because at the time, uh, most uh, of the speleogenetical uh, theories 
consider the, only the meteoric water coming into uh, the karst massive. And this was not the case uh, of these caves. Oh, uh, the cooperation was, uh, with the Italian caves was uh, uh, very large at, at the time. And uh, it was possible to organize by the official Italian television uh, the shot of a, 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 a film on the gigantic caves of Podolia. And of course, the main actor was uh, uh, Alexander. Well, uh, in, uh, in 1997, uh, 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 we had the possibility to guest uh, Klim in uh, Italy for six months uh, in between uh, the University of uh, Padua and Bologna. And in that time, he prepared the very first uh, 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 monography on gypsum cast of the world. Uh, because at, at the time, really, uh, uh, probably the people interested in gypsum cast were less than five or ten, and uh, each one of them knows only uh, the uh, the caves close uh, his house. So that this uh, book, uh, printed uh, as a, a, an issue of uh, the International Journal of Speleology, uh, was extremely important to spread the knowledge about uh, gypsum cast. Our last visit uh, uh, on a gypsum cave occurred in uh, uh, 2015. Uh, uh, when we met uh, in Spain just to see uh, a, 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 a cave not so large uh, by in a cave in Andalusia, but extremely important because uh, Klim re recognized immediately that uh, this was uh, really a, 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 an hypogenic uh, cave. But uh, uh, until now, we have spoken about uh, uh, um, the gypsum cave activities of uh, Klim, but he, he uh, was much more than a, a gypsum caver and a scientist. Uh, I really believe that uh, Klim uh, is one of the best and most complete speleologists uh, of the world. And, uh, uh, in this, uh, they, its characteristics is uh, very similar to that of Giovanni Badino. Uh, in fact, Klim loved every aspect of speleology from exploration to site, not neglecting organizational uh, aspects. Well, he was a beautiful organizer and he coordinated a lot of the big expedition, the most uh, uh, um, important, by my opinion, is that uh, uh, on Arabica Massive, where uh, under his uh, uh, leadership, Krubera uh, became the deepest cave, uh, cave of the world. But he also uh, served uh, the UAS for the last 30 years. Uh, he was uh, uh, a joint secretary then um, and president of the commission of cast hydrogeology and speleogenesis uh, and uh, he was also vice president from 2001 to 2009. Uh, oh. He uh, had the possibility when Sperestroika uh, uh, was all, all on uh, to be invited uh, in the States and in Canada. And this, in this manner, he had the possibility to know and to cooperate with the, uh, the best cast uh, scientists of that uh, period. And uh, he had the possibility to uh, have contact all over the world. And from uh, uh, then on, 
uh, he normally uh, attended all the important uh, reunion of uh, castologists and uh, uh, attended the, uh, all the congresses and meetings, uh, but also went in a scientific expedition all around the world. And uh, since then, he started to study the uh, hypogenic cave. That means caves uh, uh, which has uh, their genesis from uh, the depth uh, up. Oh, uh, uh, and I want just uh, to spend a few words about uh, the contribution of Alexander to the progress of speleological science. Uh, he uh, had the possibility to print uh, over 300 publications uh, and over 100 in journals with impact factor. And this is uh, uh, really uncommon for uh, cast scientists. And he, uh, by my opinion, he printed some milestone. We have already seen uh, that on gypsum cast uh, areas of the world. And another one is uh, uh, that uh, on the speleogenesis and evolution of cast aquifer that was based on a previous uh, monography he printed uh, some uh, years before uh, on hydrogeological concepts of sedimentary uh, basins, linking the hydrogeology uh, uh, to the cast evolution. And the second milestone uh, uh, is uh, on uh, 2017, uh, uh, there is hypogenesis, paleogenesis. Uh, to prepare this book, he uh, traveled uh, the four continents uh, to uh, see directly all kind of uh, caves that you want to describe in this book. Well, what happened? I don't know. Okay. Um, but uh, 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 Klim not only considered uh, the uh, uh, the main uh, stream uh, of the cast reserves uh, that is the description of, of, of the principal uh, category of caves. Sometimes he, he also considered uh, a small example, but extremely important. Uh, and I want to remind here uh, the, uh, his uh, paper with Andrejuk on uh, strange uh, pseudo speleothems. I say pseudo because they are speleothems completely composed by uh, fossils uh, of the microorganisms. And this open a door on the uh, relationship in between uh, living uh, organisms and uh, speleothems. We now are starting thinking about the fact that most of the deposit in caves are probably uh, influenced by uh, biogenic mechanisms. Oh. And finally, uh, I, I want to uh, um, cite uh, the fact that uh, uh, even he, of course, uh, loved his caves uh, in Podolia, the largest of the world, and uh, by my opinion, worth uh, to become world heritage. He was one of the first writing uh, an endorsement uh, for the, uh, our proposal for world heritage uh, uh, to a gypsum cast of our area. And finally, I want to uh, say that uh, the, uh, the passion he has for Cape was so strong that uh, uh, he went over the field uh, uh, in a cast area uh, a few days before his death. And that's all. Uh, so that I want uh, to, to say that he was truly a, an eclectic caver. 
was a very strong explorer, an outstanding organizer of large expedition, one of the longest serving leaders of the UAS, one of the world's uh, leading expert on cast in gypsum and author of some fundamental study of cast. Uh, and last and not least, was a good friend of mine. Thank you for your attention. Thank, thank you very much indeed, Paolo. That was that was terrific. I, I, I was lucky enough to be with Alexander on his, his last caving trip over here in the UK and uh, it was a, a terrible shock, a terrible yeah. shock losing him. Uh, he's he's really, as you say, what, the outstanding yeah. full caver and geologist. Yeah. I, uh, I I agree totally. So uh, we 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 move on um, as as it's, it's such a shame that he can't be here to listen to this and contribute to our debate, but. Uh, now it's it's time for us to move to to a, a, another area of gypsum cast, uh, the Sivas gypsum cast in Turkey, uh, and uh, uh, we're very grateful to uh, Ergin Gokaya uh, from the Department of Geography at Ankara University, uh, who's going to tell us about that area. So uh, uh, please, uh, if you uh, if you share your screen now uh, and. Uh, and tell us about the area. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. John. Thank you so much. Uh, we are really sad about our tragic loss, and we are honored to be part of this organization dedicated to Alexander Klimchok. So I would like to thank you for the invitation. In this talk, I am going to talk about uh, Sivas gypsum cast, especially sinkhole and polio development in the Sivas gypsum cast which is one of the most outstanding gypsum cast areas in the world. Uh, the Sivas gypsum cast located at the northern sector of Sivas sedimentary basin uh, in central Anatolia. The investigated gypsum polyas and sinkholes have developed in the northern evaporite domain. The gray area indicates the gypsum outcrops. It's ages Oligocene based on cartographic relationship and vertebrate fauna. And uh, this evaporite unit was deposit deposited by recycling of older evaporites in the Playa Lake system, according to isotope data. And uh, its thickness is several hundred meters. I would like to start with gypsum polyas. As you know, polyas are the largest separation in karst terrain characterized by uh, flat floors, despite their large dimensions and significant applied interest, uh, they received limited attention in the geomorphological literature. Uh, there are some reference to gypsum polyes, but they are uh, incidental. Probably for this reason, uh, polyes are often defined as depression endemic to carbonate karst. Uh, in Sivas gypsum karst, Two physiographic zones can be differentiated. Uh, <clears throat> one of them is Northern Ridge, which corresponds to a hanging wall of the Sivas Trust. Another one is low lying area associated with the main river, Kızılırmak River Valley, which includes uh, polyes and most of the bedrock collapse sinkholes analyzed uh, in this work. Uh, here we can see Differential uplift related to trust geometry. This is uh, this blue one, uh, early Miocene marine limestones and marls. The base of the formation is situated 300 meters above the uh, hanging wall, providing uh, a minimum measure of differential uplift. Uh, the white polygons are uh, polyes, poly bottoms. Uh, they form a northeast southwest oriented uh, morphostructural trough situated south of the antiformal gypsum ridge in low lying area. We have mapped 13 polyas in the central se sector of Sivas gypsum cars with areas ranging from 1 to 10 uh, square kilometers and variable geometries in plan. 
the analyzed gypsum polyes uh, characterized by extremely flat floors and all the depression host lakes either ephemeral or permanent. Um, also, most of the polyes display ill-defined boundary between the poly floor and the flat plain of the main river. Also, uh, their floor locally lie below. The, for instance, in this polya, at the bottom of the polya uh, located six meters below the flat plain. These are also closed depression because they are drained internally. So these depressions can be classified as semi-closed polyes. Uh, they can be affected by two types of flooding. One of them is, as you can see here, groundwater flooding by water table rise. The, another one is surface water flooding during floods of the allogenic uh, main rivers. When the river flood, water can penetrate into the uh, adjacent depression, adjacent polya floor. The margin of the polyes uh, display slope, uh, display gentle slope or scarp slope with convex and vertical profiles. We always see uh, steep slopes uh, where ground uh, flood water and gypsum interact. This cause solutional undercutting on the edge of the polya. The undermined slopes uh, experience retreat uh, by rock falls and topless. This produce uh, accumulation of gypsum blocks. And the rapid slope retreat by combined effect uh, of basal solution undercutting and uh, mass busting process result in a, a different uh, slope profiles and slope rate, as you can see here. The upper uh, gentle section displays uh, perched gullies, uh, hanging valleys, indicating the rapid scarp retreat. Due to this process, the polyes expand significantly. The marginal slopes, some of the polyes includes large bedrock collapsing posts that may be associated with uh, ponors and food, uh, food caves like this one. A uh, rock collapse process tends to reduce breach or threshold between, uh, between the sinkholes and the polyes. Eventually, these marginal sinkholes can incorporate with the polya by sinkhole and polya expansion. They create local uh, environments like amphitheater shape. So this area most probably used to be a bedrock collapse sinkholes. There are also ponors. Uh, float water food caves. These ponds are the main water outlet features of the polyes. The origin of the polyes, uh, there are, we differentiate their origin. You can see uh, the red dashed line uh, indicates the relict valley. These are remnants of the incident drainage network. They used to be tributaries of the main rivers, uh, according to their gradient and forking. Eight, of, uh, eight out of 13 map polyes occur associated with uh, of the relic valleys. Uh, it is like that, it is a slope is towards to uh, poly bottom. Uh, the floor of uh, relic valleys show clear inclination towards the poly bottom. And this type of polyes orientation is consistent with the associated valley. It is like an inheritance. Overall, these polyes show high elongation radius. But another one here uh, between two polyes, we mapped uh, six terrace levels, which is indicated by uh, white polygons. The distribution of the terraces and the present day river channel show that the change in the path of Ajusu Valley. Ajusu River is here. Uh, most probably, it used to flow like this. It used to be a uh, Mender, uh, uh, Mender uh, elbow. But eventually, uh, the Mender was only started to develop in the 
two abandoned arms of the valley. So uh, the abandonment, this is this is the Shkapopolia. Here is the Shkapopolia again. The abandonment of the valley section is also supported by the presence of fluvial gravel below the uh, Dishkapopolia, uh, according to drilling data. There are some quarries uh, in the some terraces. They display a striking example of paleocene cores. As you can see here, uh, these are mostly cover collapsing cores bounded by uh, well-defined collapse faults. These are gravitational faults. So this is non-tectonic deformations. And three of the polyas initiated from compound uh, bedrock collapsing poles. They are characterized by complex geometry and plan with high sinusity indexes uh, and the presence of large permanent plate with significant depth. This is Turduge polya, uh, which is the biggest poly in the study area, which hosts one of the biggest karst lakes in Turkey. And there is a nested uh, collapse sinkholes in the depression, uh, which is recognizable by darker tone. So uh, overall, the gypsum polyas are active base level polyas. In contrast, uh, in contrast with most of the poly in carbonate cast regions, the gypsum polyes of Sivas are not controlled by tectonic systems. Uh, we differentiate three, uh, three types of polyes according to their uh, cartographic relationship with other landforms and their uh, hydrogeomorphological characteristics. They initiated from compound simple, abandoned valley section, and relic valley. As you know, this type of evolution model, you know, uh, Dolain, Uvala, and Polya, this model uh, fits with the evolutionary model proposed by Hovan Switch, although this concept was largely dismissed later. But we see that in gypsum cast, uh, this model is uh, possible. And also to our knowledge, uh, this is the first case study that documents evolutionary trend involving the transformation of fluvial landforms into the large depression, large polyas. And the uh, main factors in the development of polyas are uh, favorable structural setting because they develop in the low lying area associated with the main rivers. And also abundant aggressive waters that contribute to basal undercutting and associated with uh, of margins of polya. Eventually, enlargement of depression. Um, another one is presence of fluvial karst landscape because poly is initiated from relic valleys and abandoned uh, valley section. The, another one is clusters of uh, bedrock collapsing poles that, ex, that can experience rapid enlargement. Bedrock is uh, another topic for the Sivas gypsum karst. Uh, we mapped 295 bedrock collapse simples, and 39 of them are compound simples. We differentiate them according to their evolution stage. Uh, this is the young, fresh looking cylindrical simples are characterized by subcircular geometry and uh, sub vertical to overhanging gypsum cliffs affected by rock falls and topless process. Their floor uh, generally show gypsum blocks. Their major axis uh, ranks, ranks from 25 to 121 meters. They have an average depth of 11 meters. The conical sinkholes, they are characterized by flat uh, bottom underlain by clay deposits. They have generally uh, degraded margins. Their slopes are dissected by gullies. Their average depth is 26 meters. Their major axes are much more larger than uh, cylindrical ones. 
As you know, uh, after formation of the sinkhole, we see more or less this geometry, uh, steep slopes. The depth is high. Uh, once formed, once sinkhole formed, uh, the, the sinkhole starts to widen due to mass vasting process and solutional denudation. But these sediments uh, are accumulating at the bottom of sinkholes. Uh, this process uh, means that depth decreases. But in Sivas gypsum cast, we see the opposite. Uh, mature sinkholes are much more deeper than younger cylindrical sinkholes. So the expansion of the uh, sinkhole margins eventually leads to merge nearby sinkholes and the formation of compound depression. These are the largest and morphologically more complex uh, depression. This is density map of the uh, bedrock collapse sinkholes. Uh, you can see the spatial distribution. This map shows us that the majority of the sinkholes, 91% uh, of them, occur in the low lying area. Uh, whereas hanging wall uh, antiform dominated by thousands of sinkholes that form a striking uh, polygonal karst landscape. The sinkhole types observed in hanging wall antiform and low lying area surface are markedly different uh, despite they are underlain by same lithology. Uh, this sinkhole zonation can be attributed to hydrogeological position of the different areas. Um, the high, uh, hanging wall antiform, antiform is the highest recharge area dominated by water infiltration and downward Vados flow, uh, which has created exceptionally well-developed polygonal cars. Also, moreover, this zone is less favorable for the formation of bedrock collapsing cause since uh, the phreatic zone is located at significant depth in contrast to low-lying area. Another sinkhole type is a cover substance sinkholes. We have mapped to, uh, three hundred cover substance sinkhole. Uh, they mainly occur in the flat plain and lower terraces. They form large dip, large compound depression, and some of them breathed by farmers. Uh, we detect them from the old aerial pictures. So as I showed you, uh, we see evolutionary stage uh, of bedrock collapsing cause. They display continuous morphologic spectrum. They range from relatively small uh, cylindrical holes to large and deeper conical depression. Uh, this reflects the geomorphic evolution of these sinkholes involving the degradation of slopes by mass blasting process and erosion process. Although the largest known uh, gypsum cave chambers are less than uh, 100 meters in length. Mature sinkholes can reach hundreds of meters in diameter. And this is associated with post collapse uh, morphological evolution of the bedrock collapse sinkholes. When they form, the mass vasting process, topless and rock falls process is active. They are enlarging uh, because of this process. And when the side slopes <clears throat> reach repose angle, uh, the development of mass fasting process and as this process stop, and the slopes are mainly degraded by mechanical erosion through gullying and sheet washing. Uh, they are also getting deeper. Uh, due to solution of removal of the deposits uh, underlying the sinkhole. And this type of morphological evolution with significant post-collapse solution denudation differs from uh, that observed in carbonate uh, cars. We compare the size of sinkholes in Sivas with those from other car setting uh, carbonate, evaporites, epigene, hypogene, and also different sediments covering the karst track. 
in order to extract genetic evolutionary evolutionary inter uh, um, the, the graph showed the relationship between cumulative frequency and the major axis of sinkholes inventory in the uh, Sivas gypsum pars and other gypsum pars regions. The red one is, is the red one is a uh, bedrock collapse sinkholes in the uh, Sivas. As you can see, perhaps unexpectedly, bedra, the bedrock collapse sinkholes from the Sivas gypsum pars show the greatest dimensions, even bigger than the large sinkholes developed in a uh, hypogene evaporate cars in San Miguel. The apparently uh, anomalous size distribution can be attributed to the old age of most of the sinkholes at Sivas, and they have significant growth uh, that, they that they have experienced by degradation of slopes, eventually amalgamation with uh, nearby uh, sinkholes. Before I finish, I would like to show you uh, Lota sinkhole. This is Lota sinkhole with permanent lake with uh, significant depth. Here is a uh, Lota polya bottom with ephemeral lake. Here is collapsed cave section between two collapses. Uh, there is natural bridge. And this area is a uh, very nice uh, geosite. But if you look closer, uh, this site is a pile of rubbish site rather than geosite. And if you want to have a look, uh, if you want to get more information, you can have a look at our papers on uh, the Sivas gypsum cars. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I I really enjoyed that. That's, that's extremely interesting. Um, the, the the one area that that you, you didn't mention in terms of cave development in that area. Um, uh -huh. What what have you got in the way of caves? Uh, uh, let me show you. Yeah. I, I saw I saw those foot foot wall caves, but to, yes, to, yes. Form, to form the big collapses, there must yes. have been at some point some yes. quite significant cave systems in that mm -hmm. area. Yes, um, yes. and it, it's 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 that that's that's slightly the puzzle, isn't it? Um, the the these are the what you're showing here are some very nice caves, but then they're, they're not the big integrated systems. That you'd expect, at least in a carbonate cast, to have formed the big collapsed dough lines. Mm -hmm. um, so, have you have you any thoughts on that? Do you mean? Uh, do you mean uh, maybe uh, they are generally have flat, uh, aggregated floor because yeah. of the sediment accumulation? That's why they they are getting wider towards the edge of the. Uh, uh, <clears throat> margin of the caves. They are also joint controlled fissures and rock pendants, as you can see. Mm. A solution uh, pockets are also important. They are characterized by these type of uh, shapes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, as I say, we, we, we. I'm, I'm taking my chairman's privilege to ask you the questions because we're not normally doing the questions, but I found that a really interesting, uh, very, very, very interesting area. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't know that at all. I've, I've only visited the carbonate cast areas in Turkey, so uh, it's very, very nice to have seen that. So thank you very much indeed for that. And thank you so much, John. Thank you. Yeah, surely there are some good sites that we should, some geosites and also areas that should be properly protected. So that's mm -hmm. that's very, very good. Mm -hmm. OK, well, thank you uh, again. And thank you for, for the the other two presentations this morning. We've we've got a short break now uh, and we'll be resuming uh, at uh, uh, it's two o'clock in uh, in Central European time. So uh, uh, hopefully see uh, see you again uh, again then. So thank you. Thank you so much.
Hi, <laughs> everything worked fine here in Valkenried. I'm very happy that everything turned out so nice. Yeah. And I just want to uh, give a little feedback from the uh, YouTube channel. We had about uh, 20 uh, people online watching us. Um, and uh, there were just, um, Nadia was saying hello to all of us. Um, and um, Nadia and Ferdinando Di Donna, uh, they, uh, they enjoyed uh, the, uh, um, the presentation of Paolo Forti um, on Alexander Klimchuk very much. And this was the outcome of the YouTube channel so far. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Barbel. So uh, we'll we'll resume again in uh, in about thirty minutes' time. Is that okay? Yes. Thank Perfect. you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. See you.
Hi. Hello, Jan. Hello. Okay. Oh. My time says we're, we're about one minute away. Is that about right? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, the uh, the people here on Zoom and also those of you who are listening via YouTube. So we're continuing our symposium on gypsum cast. Uh, and uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Jose Maria Calafora from the University of Almeria uh, to talk about the gypsum cast of Sorbus uh, in uh, Almeria, Spain. So uh, over to you, Jose. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. And thank you to all the organizers at Barbell and many others. I will try to, to share my desktop. We have some problems. Ahora presenta el sistema de seguridad privacidad. You're okay with the share screen, are you? N no. Wait, wait a minute. Uh, the Mac needs some uh, permissions. Ah. In the Zoom. Okay. Sorry. No, but I can. No, I don't know, John, what is the problem? Okay, well, while you're looking at that, are, are you able to just, is, how big is your PowerPoint? How, what the file size? Is it something you can email but to me? It, ah, email, okay. okay. Yeah, so if you email that to me, I, I should be able to share it and then you can talk to it. Let me see. Mail. Mm. 
I need to use we transfer because uh, it's too big. Okay. Um, should we? I'm just looking at the at the program. Is um, is Fred Hart uh, with us at the moment? Maybe it could be better if you pass and I will try to change my computer, for example, if you pass to yeah. the other presenter. Yeah, okay, let's do that. So if you if you send it me via WeTransfer, I'll uh, mm. I'll try and have it ready for uh, for in a moment. Okay. John, your email? J dot gun G U N N dot one dot one dot one. Yeah, with the, the number one, not O N E. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. B dot gun dot one at B H A M dot dot A C dot UK. Genau. Video ist freigeschaltet. Ja. Ist gut. Ähm, mhm. John? Ja. Um, we could have a half presentation now. <lacht> um, <lacht> because um, uh, Fried hat um, Stefan uh, Kemp. <lacht> okay, uh, Fried hat uh, won't be speaking. It's me, yes. Stefan Kempe. Okay, Stefan. I will be speaking on behalf of us here, all of us in the in the convention hall. Um, and uh, this will be the first half of the German talk. Well, with, with, with the third option is I'm just looking at Kevin's here as well. Are, are you are you up and ready to go? I am, I am more than happy to go now if you want me to. Okay, I I think let's do that, and then what we'll do is Jose will send me his his presentation. I will hopefully have that ready. While at the same time, I do want to listen to Kevin's as well. So uh, it's it's okay. We 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 are getting there. Uh, so basically, Kevin's going to talk to us about gypsum cast uh, in New Mexico. So this is Kevin Stafford from Austin State University, and it's early in the morning in the in the United States so thanks very much for for being up and and ready with your presentation Kevin and uh, uh you you fire away next and then we'll uh, we'll see where we go from there uh, at least the sun is up now it's been up for about 15 minutes here oh, okay <laughs> can you see my screen uh just a second it says it, you've started screen sharing so that's it. there we go. Yep, that looks that's looking great. Okay, um, I'm actually going to be talking about gypsum karst in the Delaware Basin, which goes from southeastern New Mexico down into West Texas. So it's a little bit larger region than the the title infers. And I'm actually with Stephen F. Austin State University, which often gets confused as just Austin State University here in the in the U.S. Yeah. Um, so what we are looking at is the, the greater Permian Basin region, which is a large evaporitic province that goes from the western portion of Texas up through the Panhandle of Texas into Oklahoma, into Kansas, Colorado, and back into New Mexico. It's a very broad region, but the only surficial exposures of any extensive gypsum are really in the western portion of the Delaware Basin down here in the item circled in two, and then in the eastern portion of New Mexico, kind of along this boundary of the, the salt limit. Uh, I do want to point out that if y'all have not read it or downloaded it, there is a publication by the Oklahoma Geologic Survey, Circular 113, that was put out two years ago based on a conference at the Geological Society of America 
this is probably the most current up-to-date single, single compendium of the evaporate cars that we have here in the US and what's going on with it. Um, all of this is Permian, like I said. We are looking at stuff from lower Permian to upper Permian. Today, we're gonna focus on the Achoan material or Lepingian, if you wanna to refer to it as that. And then some of the, the Guadalupian stuff, the Artesia group. All of this is associated with these foreland basins that were formed when South America and North America collided there in the late Carboniferous moving into the Permian. Um, like I said, this is going to be the region we focus on is the Delaware Basin. So looking at that, many of y'all are probably familiar with the Guadalupe Mountains because of Carlsbad Cavern and because of what you get a cave there which are classic, fairly famous hypogene caves, um, very large, large open voids that we have in that area. Those are developed in the Capitan Lime stuff. We are going to look briefly at the Seven Rivers Formation, which is an interbedded dolomite and gypsum, which occurs up on the shelf. So this Northwestern shelf beyond the major reef complex, which is the Capitan Limestone, which formed the boundary, the border of the Delaware Basin during deposition. We're then gonna spend most of our time looking at the Castile Formation, which filled in the entire interior of the Delaware Basin in the late Permian as open marine connectivity was lost by the closing of the Hobie Channel, which would have been down in the Southern portion, close to where the Glass Mountains are exposed today. Beneath that Castile are some Belkin Silicoclastics, Above the Castile is a Salado Formation, which is um, predominantly halite. There is a little bit of gypsum and a little bit of, or anhydrite in the subsurface, and a little bit of dolomite. And then above that's the Rustler, which is interbedded gypsum and dolomite. Um, the Salado is somewhat famous here in the U.S. Um, because that is the, the, the formation that hosts our um, nuclear waste repository where it's being stored in isolation with a halite massive, and that's up here in, in New Mexico region. Um, so y'all may have recognized this picture earlier from Paulo. Um, Alexander Klimchok, I'm going to digress for a second. Um, when he was here in 2007 as a visiting scientist with the National Cave and Karst Research Institute, I was very fortunate to actually have him live with me for about nine months. Um, I was a graduate student at the time working on my dissertation, and he was looking for a place to live while he was a visiting science scientist here, and he moved in with me, and I, he became a very close friend and a colleague, and even more than that, I, I attribute him as really a mentor in kind of pushing me down the path of studying gypsum karst and kind of being obsessed about hypogene processes. So if nothing else, he, he definitely influenced one portion of North America as far as how my career has evolved since then. When he was here, one of the caves that we worked on was Coffee Cave, which is just north of Carlsbad Cavern. This is in the Seven Rivers Formation. So this is that back reef material that was being deposited at the same time as the Capitan Reef. It's a classic multi-level hypogene maze cave. Um, we documented morphologic features all throughout it. And we actually used this cave, he and I published a paper to kind of introduce and get the concept of his morphologic suite of rising fluids really into the American, the North American mainstream literature so that they would start recognizing it here in North America as was being done um, on the other side of the Atlantic. Along with that model, we were able to, of course, see that the caves were all being formed as a result of rising fluids migrating up towards the Pecos River, which is a, a fairly significant river going through eastern New Mexico that's been in place in the region for at least 50 million years, migrating slowly, slowly towards the east. Waters are recharging upslope on what's referred to as the Pecos Slope and the upland regions into carbonate units and then discharging at the potential metric low of the Pecos River as the Pascos River then works its way through these seven river evaporates towards the east, we're breaching the cave so that we can then get in and expose them. To the north of that, about 100 kilometers north, 
We also have a series of large cenote-like st structures in the Seven Rivers, which are just collapsed features through these interbedded gypsums and dolomites, again, forming by the exact same process. This is all occurring proximal to the Pecos River again, where these fluids are upwelling. These are just two examples. There are numerous examples all throughout the Artesia group in, in the eastern side of New Mexico that show a strong, strong dominance of hypogene process with variable degrees of epigene overprinting. But the Pecos River seems to be a key in driving the, the hypogene fluids upwards towards this, this potential metric low. Well, that's just to kind of put things into the context of what's going on in the northern shelf which are the, the, a, a large portion of the gypsum deposits there in New Mexico. But as we're moving downward, again, I point you out the Guadalupe Mountains where Carlsbad Cavern and Lechuguilla Cave are. Um, we're gonna be focusing on this blue area, which is the outcrop region of the Castile Formation. The Castile Formation is, it's basically equivalent to the Zechstein, um, and it's a laminated gypsum, calcite um, um, unit with some interbedded layers of halite. It dips towards the east, northeast at about two to three degrees in the subsurface. So over here on the far eastern side of the Delaware Basin, the unit is actually about 400 meters thick in the subsurface. But over here on the western side, where it's in contact with the Bell Canyon formation, it, it moves down to a solutional margin, basically where it's all being dissolved away. So uplifted on the west, moves down dip towards the east. Throughout the Delaware Basin, we have a series of large scale subsidence structures. Um, these subsidence structures are occurring along the margin of the eastern portion of the Capitan Reef complex, and then kind of along the Pecos River and an old ancestral river that moves down towards the south. These areas are large substance, uh, substance features that are filled with primarily Cenozoic deposits, alluvium deposits, and they are all formed by the upward migration and interstellar dissolution of the halides in the Castile and also halides within the Salado Formation. So we're dissolving from depth, forming these depressions. The ones along the Pecos River, again, of course, associated with the, the potentiometric driver of that low of the river, and then the ones over here on the eastern side of the basin, these are actually associated with the upward migration of fluids from the Capitan Reef complex that are migrating upward. So water's recharging in the Guadalupe Mountains, working their way around the perimeter of the Capitan Reef, and then migrating upwards and dissolving through the, the primary of the Salado in this region, because this is on the edge of the basin where the Castile is limited in its deposition. Into the interior, we also see lots of breccia pipes within the Castile outcrop area, um, where we have stoped all the way to the surface, um, dissolving at the base and then collapsing upwards as we move. Here, this little topographic high that we're seeing, um, it's about 70 meters in diameter, and it's actually composed of rustler and, and some Cretaceous rocks where they had dropped down into this upward stoping breccia pipe and now with surface denudation remain as kind of these topographic highs. Associated with that, we have large scale blanket breccias throughout the region, which are the result of the interstellar dissolution of the halite within the Castile Formation. So in the field, you commonly find these brecciated regions either associated with large breccia pipes or with the the removal of the halite and partial removal of the associated gypsum causing regional collapse. Coupled with that, we actually see a fair amount of calcitization across the region. Um, the, the area hosts hydrocarbons at depth and the carboniferous strata, um, currently there is a lot of exploration, a lot of production being produced, producing petroleum from those lower units, but those same units that produce the hydrocarbons have been leaking upward for many millions of years, um, probably at least 40 to 50 million years. And as they migrate upwards, those light hydrocarbons, as they are passing through the Castile sulfates, have fueled sulfate reduction. 
we have done some isotope studies and it's it's the isotopes cannot tell us if it's thermal chemical sulfate reduction or if it's if it's microbial bacterial sulfate reduction. Um, you will see in the literature basically both sides being kind of pushed out there as being what's going on, which is really just comes down to um, which which story you like better. But these also are forming commonly these topographic highs or what have been termed Castile buttes within the region because these calcized masses are hardened and as we see surface generation occurring, they are being left as remnants up high. Within some of the caves, we actually can see the boundary layers between this kind of darker yellowish tan color material and the white, which the, the tan material is the calcitized material. White is some of the original gypsum that has not been calcitized yet. Coupled with that, we have significant native sulfur deposits where the system went anoxic when we were going with calcitization. Um, these were mined fairly heavily commercially in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, last 50 years or so, they have really seen no production whatsoever. It's just cheaper to get our sulfur from the, the byproducts of sour gas and oil production in the region. Today at the surface, we have venting structures where we're actually getting some um, secondary gypsum precipitating directly at the crust, which are associated with some of these light hydrocarbons migrating upwards and probably some active calcization and sulfur deposits that are occurring today. Well, coupling with that, we see that many of these native sulfur deposits have been subsequently oxidized by later phases of meteoric waters coming through them. And we end up with massive deposits of selenitic crystals that have replaced those as secondary gypsum. On occasion, we do find native sulfur still embedded in that selenite, um, which gives us better confidence that this really is an oxidation process. Um, you will get some fairly complex, unique caves that form when we get into these massive selenitic structures, um, oftentimes just forming along the crystal facies, but sometimes forming directly within the large massive structures themselves. As far as your traditional cave and karst manifestations, we have, of course, a landscape dominated heavily by sinkholes. Um, on the geomorphic map to the right, the blue is where we actually have exposed bedrock. Um, this region was much wetter during the Pleistocene. And since the Pleistocene, we've had the development of fairly significant gypsic soils, which have infilled a large, large portion of the sinkholes in the area. Sinkholes that are open today range from your your classic incised sinking stream type systems to circular collapse structures, but the vast majority are infilled with these Pleistocene alluvial sediments. We did a study years ago trying to look at just the density of surficial manifestations, and we, we saw dense clusterings of surficial manifestations. Um, some areas where we were approaching 50 features per square kilometer, so fairly large sinkholes, 50 ohm within a square kilometer, really, really dense karst activity. Um, currently, we're working on redoing this because we were using early data at this time before we had LIDAR. And now that we have LIDAR data with 50 centimeter resolution for the whole area, we're going to redo it. And I expect that we're probably going to at least find that there's five, if not 10 times as many sinkholes as we originally thought there were in the area. Well, moving into the caves, the caves that we see out there, we of course, again, have a very, very strong dominance of hypogene caves. We have multi-story um, maze caves. They're not necessarily the classic rectilinear maze caves. Um, what we find are small scale folded structures in the area and the caves are developed along these, the axes of the synclines and the anticlines and the small scale folding, as well as along the joint sets. Um, People always wonder about the name of this dead bunny hole. Every time we went in this cave, there was another dead bunny in the entrance and we never figured out why, but you name them because of what you find in the cave. We then also have, of course, the individual isolated chambers that we find um, across the region and the developed in the Castile Formation. But we do also have these almost, what I'd like to refer to as a single riser system. At first glance, it does appear to be almost epigene, but the sinkhole feeding this is really small. 
and does not, if you think about the solution kinetics of gypsum, justify a cave that is almost 600 meters long surveyed and close to 100 meters deep, which is actually the, the deepest gypsum cave that we have in North America, well, at least documented. And when we started studying and going through it and mapping it, we found hypogene features throughout. We found uh, lots of epigene overprinting, but the epigene overprinting kind of stops about two thirds of the way down. So the surface waters that we're bringing in are becoming saturated as they're overprinting these upper portions and the lower portions are pretty much completely dominated by hypogene processes. We, we see current active hypogene type processes occurring in the area. We do have artesian springs that discharge in certain areas. These all have a, a fairly strong hydrogen sulfide smell associated with them and often have large bacterial colonies at those, at those orify where these waters are coming out. Back in 2015, we actually documented kind of an anomalous phase where we had two years of extremely heavy rainfall in the area that provided a lot of recharge to the underlying Bell Canyon siliciclastic formation. That raised the aquifer or the potentiometric surface through the Castile formation up above the land surface. And we actually saw the reversal of sinkholes where they basically became estivals and are discharging water out. Looking at historical records, this appears to happen on about a 30 year time scale in the area. So we are getting still the ascending fluids coming up through and overprinting some of these features that appear initially as being completely epigenic at the surface. Part of those investigations were really started because we were contacted by the Texas Department of Transportation to figure out what had happened with a section of their road that had completely collapsed and crumbled apart. Um, this is in northern portion of the, the, the Castile outcrop area in Texas. And you can tell that this portion of the road has been completely rebuilt. Well, when we went in and we started doing excavations and we started looking at the rocks, it was really just heavily leached and you could pull books of, of individual laminate just out of the ground, it was just crumbling apart. We also looked at some of the material that was documented in the area and the text dot fortunately had taken photos when the area was flooded this entire area was underwater and there were artesian springs squirting water up through the road and through the surrounding area about 20 centimeters above the land surface. So again, during that anomalous recharge event that occurred over two years, the, the area, basically the water table, the potentiometric surface of the underlying Bell Canyon extended above the land surface and we leached the, the gypsum out in the near surface from the rising waters passing through. Similarly, joints within the region um, show buckling at the surface and do not allow any meteoric water into them. And those then show um, solutional modifications with cuspate forms when you start looking down into the open features. Um, this is very reminiscent to the, the one paper that Alexander published on the the, the Crimea Piedmont region, where they had some fractures that were solutionally modified by ascending fluids. And as cliff retreat occurred, they were exposing these hypogene features within those walls. So we're seeing the same thing in the gypsum facies here. Additionally, this bottom right-hand figure is a classic gypsum tumuli, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. But on many of the breccia pipes that we see, we get tumuli-like features, but when we start excavating down into them, turns out that they are secondary precipitates of gypsum associated with condensation corrosion at the top of these porous breccia pipe structures. Well, obviously there are the epigene caves in the area. Um, most of these tend to be laterally limited, fairly small. They rapidly decrease in aperture just because, you know, we're saturating that gypsum fairly quickly as we're dissolving them out. And they're almost all joint controlled, so structurally controlled shallow features. Of course, all the hypogene caves do have variable degrees of epigene overprinting on top of them, which we're, we're, we're sorting out. So if we look at kind of our best understanding of what's going on in the area, 
we we know that at the end of the Permian, basically the area was subaerially exposed. We had filled everything in. The Delaware Basin no longer existed. The Greater Permian Basin was all filled in. As we moved into the early Mesozoic, it was pretty much kind of dominated by fluvial process, terrestrial erosion, and and more more subaerial exposure processes. There was a brief period in the Cretaceous when the region was once again flooded by epicontinental sea and a little bit of minor carbonate and carbonate deposition at that time before the seas then receded again. Into the Mesozoic Cretaceous tertiary, we actually see the region gets uplifted due to the Laramide orogeny, which created our Rocky Mountains here in the United States. That brought up the whole entire region above sea level, and it's never been below it again. By the late Paleogene, that uplift had brought us up about 1,600 meters above sea level, but we had also transitioned into a period of, of extension, basin and range extension here, where the western portion of the U.S. tried to split apart. It's failed rifting, but it tried to split apart, and that rifting elevated the geothermal gradient and also induced some of the, or did the final induction of the, the, the tilting of the region towards the east northeast. We believe, based on what we can see on the karst development stuff in the area, by the early Neogene, we were getting the hydrocarbons migrating up through the system. We were getting early hypogene development um, at the basal contact between the Cherry Canyon, which, or I mean the Bell Canyon, which is directly beneath the Castile. As we moved into the middle of Neogene, we start to get the surficial exposure of some of the upper Chowan deposits in the region, continued migration upwards of the hypogene cars, lateral development of blanket breaches as well as the breccia pipes. By the late Neogene, we're still uplifting with this basin range extension. Um, we reached 2,700 meters of uplift. We actually have the far western portion of the Delaware Basin gets down drop in one of these extensional basins. We finally begin to expose the Castile Formation we have largely removed most of the slotto halides, this light blue, from within the western portion of the gypsum or the western portion of the Delaware Basin. We've removed most of the halite within the Castile, and we're getting the superficial, superficial breaching of calcitized masses, um, breccia pipes, and things like that. Moving on to the Pleistocene, that's where we believe we basically form the landscape we see today with fairly heavy overprinting of the epigene processes illustrated in light green and greater and greater exposure of the, the calcitized and the hypogene processes. Effectively, everything is still occurring today. We're just seeing that this hypogene stuff is moving farther and farther and farther to the east. And as a result, the epigene stuff, stuff is marching behind it and, and overprinting all of that. Um, we are seeing a heavy level of suffusion development occurring right now as many of those sinkholes that were infilled with gypsite at the end of the Pleistocene are now being remobilized. Well, being we're talking about protection, we should bring up the topic that we don't protect gypsum karst in North America. Um, to my knowledge, Bottomless Lake State Parks, which we showed you early on of the Seven Rivers of Aprits, is a small area where we're doing a little bit of protection at a state park. When we move down to the Castile Formation, literally the only protection we're seeing is there's a cave known as Park Ranch Cave, which has got over 15 kilometers of surveyed passage and a chain link fence was put around the two major entrances. But as you can see, there are multiple entrances around it that are not protected. It's open to the public. Anybody can go there at any time. There's really no true protection. Now, as you move down, across this border into Texas, where the majority of the Castile Formation is at, and the majority of the outcrop, that's all private land. So to a certain degree, it's being protected because of extremely limited access, because it's not publicly open. So private landowners, large-scale ranchers mainly, are in that area. The big reason why we see very little protection of the evaporate cars in this region is because of Carlsbad Cavern and Lechuguia Cave up here in the Guadalupe Mountains. These areas receive the bulk of the emphasis on karst research 
within the area and the gypsum karst that you look down upon from the mountains just does not receive the attention. The, the resources available in the area for karst protection and management are being focused heavily on these world famous caves, though the gypsum karst tends to be neglected. It also tends to be understudied because most people would prefer to go work in the large carbonate caves. But fortunately, Alexander convinced me early on that gypsum was worthy of study. Um, we do have a little bit of mining occurring in the northern portion, potash deposits that are being mined out of the Salado Formation, so that's directly above the Castile. Gypsum quarries, none of these have been active for decades. This, this one's down in South Texas. There's another one up here in New Mexico. They've not been active for decades, so really nothing's going on there. Um, borrow pits do occasionally intercept karst voids, um, and cause some problems. And of course, like anywhere else in the world, people are using the sinkholes as trash deposits. Some protection is starting to occur incidentally, simply because infrastructure is trying to avoid gypsum karst and catastrophic failures associated with road development. So we have been lucky that the, the transportation departments are working with us to try and identify karst features and at least deviate roads around them and try to prevent destruction of these features by inadvertently having roads fail into them. Finally, the biggest issue we're dealing with today is the hydrocarbon industry. Um, within the Delaware Basin, petroleum activity was non-existent a little more than a decade ago, but with the advent of fracking technologies, we now see prolific oil production within the Delaware Basin and specifically within the gypsum karst region. Um, I've seen numerous drill pads and, and roads and um, pipelines that have been developed and excavated straight through sinkholes and straight through caves, simply because there's little to no management of the area um, because there is no protection plan specifically for the gypsum karst. As far as our, our conclusions, obviously, that's, I think we've illustrated that it's a, a very polygenetic system uh, of karst development in the area and variable degrees of overprinting. In New Mexico, protection is very limited. Um, it is public land mainly. So the Bureau of Land Manage here, Management here, they do have a permitting system for any type of development that occurs. And that does limit oil field activities and road development away from significant karst features. Um, but what do you define as significant? Oftentimes, hypogene features have very, very small superficial manifestations, um, but are significant at depth, while the inverse is true for the epigene. In Texas, really the fact that it's private land and very, very, very limited access, that in itself is giving some, some protection. And then of course, our oil field is having severe impact. There are other karst areas around the country, looking at the, the United States karst map, everything in green is pretty much evaporate karst. But really, this portion of eastern New Mexico and far west Texas has the highest concentration of known gypsum caves in North America. It has the longest known gypsum caves and also the deepest known gypsum caves. So it's probably the, the area that is needing protection the most. On that note, um, if anybody has questions, um, please feel free to email me. I put my email up here so you can get in touch with me at any time. And I tried to get us back on schedule, but it looks like I went about five minutes over. <laughs> no, that, that that was perfect, Kevin. Thank thank you very much. You 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 stuck to your 30 minutes. We were we were just running a little bit behind. And that was really interesting. I it, it's it's great for me. I'm not an evaporite cost specialist. And so seeing the different presentations, seeing uh, seeing Turkey, seeing yours, uh, it's been really very interesting. I I just saw a little bit of that area when I was visiting Letch and we went down to, to Park Ranch. But uh, right. yeah, it's it's uh, it's very, very nice. So thank you very much I, for that. I, I will I will give Alexander credit for sending me down this path of focusing on gypsum karst. <laughs> you, you've also answered a question of mine because the, the, that photograph of Alexander was one that he'd sent me for a presentation he did over here. And we, yep. wasn't, we weren't sure who had taken it. So when it went over to Paolo, it was photographer unknown. So do I guess you should be credited as the photographer? I, I'm the photographer. I just found it very amusing that 
Paulo put up that photo and I already had it loaded in my presentation also. <laughs> yes. Well, I you've you've got Alexander to blame for sending it to me and me for sending it to Paolo. So look, that's that's really good. That's that's what should sort of happen on a on an occasion like this. So uh, yeah, th thanks very much indeed. Thank okay. you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, no, it's been great. Thank you. Okay, Jose, have, I've got your presentation. If you need it, you're going to have another go at sharing your screen. Yes, I think. Aha. It's now good. it's possible. Let me see. Okay. Yes. Can you see? Yes, that's great. Thanks okay. very much. Okay. And thank you, Kevin, to substitute me. Okay, then uh, I, I want to show you some, some slides and photographs from the Egyptian cast of Sorbas in Spain. This is the so southern part of Spain. And uh, there is a special, a special place. This is the, the outcrop. This is a very large depression, not so large like, like there were, but uh, it's made uh, by... Um, uh, Messinian deposits that is uh, essentially marls and gypsum. This green is the outcrops of the gypsum in this uh, depression of the Sorpas Tabernas, Messinian age. That means about uh, five uh, million years ago. It was declared this gypsum karst uh, natural part by the Junta de Andalusia, this is the local government in 1988. It, it has a uh, maybe uh, some of the highest uh, density of the lines and sinkholes in Europe. There are uh, about uh, 1,000 entrances uh, to capes in only 12 uh, square kilometers. The longest gypsum cave in Spain is there. It's about nine kilometers. And uh, some of the deepest caves in the world, gypsum caves, I mean, are in the gypsum cars of Sorbas. There are about uh, 10 caves uh, over uh, 100 meters. Um, we have there in these gypsum cars many, many, many strange uh, spellothems and other gypsum geomorphological characteristics. Uh, I will center in the in some of them, like the tumuli, the hollow stalemites and gypsum balls, and also the Christmas trees. It's like uh, mega coralloids. There are also another very important characteristic but that are related with the uh, biospelology like uh, trogobia fauna inside these caves and endemic also gypsum flora close to the close to the to the door lines and sinkholes we have also in contrast the some of the largest gypsum quarries in the world in this zone here is a map i want to show you the protected area is more or less this one that is singing in red the gypsum outcrop, it's in dot white points. And the quarries, as the quarries are these zones. So you can see that the quarries is out of the area protected because uh, when we start to try to draw the, the, the limits of this protection area, we exclude specifically the quarries. For example, these quarries can develop the, the, the mining to the east, the, this one to the south, etc. But they, they are not included in the in the natural park. Some uh, slides about the general view of this area. Uh, essentially, the gypsum has a layer above this gypsum. This is all the area of the gypsum and marls. And this is the abad member that is completely plenty of marls. That is an impervious material. So the essentially the springs are related with this uh, special distribution. The, the mean rain in, in the area is, uh, is one of the, 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 the less uh, rains in, in, in Europe. It's about uh, 250 millimeters per year. This is a geomorphological map that shows that we have here a special future, geomorphological future, that is a cliff. 
that is very important in the evolution of the speleogenesis. Some experiments with the MEM, migration meter, that shows a dissolution of gypsum of more or less 0.3 millimeters per year. Microsfoliation of current, room current, many futures like in limestones, uh, candelid that is a wall current, some uh, special do lines of dissolution. With uh, always the, these do lines are plenty of ficus uh, trees because the humidity, of course. And the special um, um, sinkholes and uh, collapse uh, do lines like this is very, very characteristic of the gypsum cars absorbers. It has a development more or less special because we have a layer of gypsum, another layer of gypsum, and here in yellow, this is a marls, interbedded marls between the gypsum. So these marls are eroded, produce a collapsed to lane. They are the more typical in gypsum cars. Here you have the gypsum, the marls, and the collapsed the line. This is the cliff that I told you. With this level, this is impervious, and this is the gypsum. All the caves are developed here in this platform. This is a scheme of the evolution of the gypsum karst, uh, very related with the, the evolution of this cliff. Finally, we have uh, uh, inversion of the relief. That means that uh, the, here we have erosion of the mouths, and here we have a castification of all the Messinian seri. The tumuli they are more or less special that I know uh, there are another examples in also in Germany, in Italy, and UK, and, and other places, but here are very, very large. This is an expansion of the, of the upper layer of the gypsum. It is not made by the pass of anhydride to gypsum. Huh? Uh, there, are, there is no anhydride in the Messinian gypsum of Sorbas. There is no anhydride. So the the possibility of to expand this gypsum is related with the solution and crystallization of the own gypsum layer. That is intercrystalline species that is plenty of water in uh, humid conditions. And when the evaporation starts, uh, uh, this uh, the produce the recrystallization of the gypsum in microcrystals and the expansion of these fractures. So in general, an upflighting of the, of the upper layer. Only the upper layer, not all the layers. This is significant because the anhydride is, doesn't exist. It's a superficial process. Here are some uh, same uh, photographs illustrating this example. This is a gypsum crystal here. This is an intercrystal surface, growing of the microcrystals inside this surface. And then the expansion of the fractures, not fractured, intercrystalline uh, between crystals, and expansion of the layer. I'll go to the caves. This is the longest one, Cueva del Agua, that uh, they have a river inside. It has a river. Sorry. So uh, with uh, so very low. Uh, precipitation, we have some water inside these caves in some places when the surface of the recharge area is uh, important. There are some characteristic of the gypsum, some with cupolas and sediments related with the erosion of these cupolas. Color is controlled by the fractures. That means clearly could be phreatic uh, galleries like this in different levels. We are in the Cueva del Agua, like labyrinths. Another cave that is completely different. This is Cova Dura. Cova Dura cave is made by uh, six levels. Uh, 
and goes to the 100, 120 meters deep. And this is levels that characterized by gypsum. This is the limit of the strata. This is gypsum. And this is marls. These are the marls. So we have two processes here. First process, the uh, uh, devolution of, uh, I say, these uh, protoconduits. They are not uh, exactly ceiling uh, um, um, challenge because they are related with the presence of the marls in the first beginning uh, speleogenesis of all the area. These uh, different levels are connected with pits, not more than 20 meters each one. Go to the, another level, for example, this is the second one, is, is completely uh, equal to the first level, and so with the six levels. Look at this, this is the Mars, and the upper layer of gypsum causes some collapses from the top. So we have two processes here. First one is a formation in phreatic conditions of the um, protoconduits, these channels in the upper part of the gypsum, controlled by the Mars in yellow. And then another process completely different when the basometric level goes down that uh, starts the erosion of the Mars. So it's, it's, it's a double cast, the solution and erosion. Here, general scheme and the relation with the, some uh, springs. Go to the speleothems, a very, very, very special zone too. Here we have the speleothems that we told the hollow stalagmites. In reality, this is not common to see uh, in caves stalagmites of this diameter. It's practically uh, four centimeters, not more. Uh, it seems uh, practically stalactites in reality, in form. But they are also hollow, with hole inside, who goes to the tip, to the bottom. Here you have a detail of this hole. I told you that go. this hole goes to the bottom. It is not made exactly by the uh, dissolution of the dripping water. The, the scheme that we are uh, planning for this uh, very rare pelothem of gypsum is that uh, related with the theme that the, the stalactites are made of calcite. This is carbonate. And the stalagmites, hollow stalagmites, are made of, of course, sulfate and water. Okay, so we have the effect of the common ion here that permits that the hollow, by the solution of this common ion effect, continues completely from the beginning of the formation of the hollow stalagmite to the final situation. So the hollow is growing at the same time that the stalagmite is growing. Another thing related with uh, extrudation is uh, the gypsum balls, very common in these caves, related with the extru ex extrusion of the of the water from the from the walls. Of this scheme, many of them are void, are hollow inside. By dissolution of the of the water, stalactites uh, deflected stalactites that we have studied with isotopes, the composition of this of these uh, stalactites, and we can see that the that the direction, main direction of the wind inside the cave is not like this. It's different because here we have in these tips we have higher evaporation of the gypsum. Another speleothem very, very spectacular is the Christmas tree. This, uh, there are some, some Christmas that uh, in, this, in this cave, for example, the cave of the, of the, of the trees that uh, has a volume or height of uh, about uh, two meters, two meters high. 
the special the special characteristic of the disk freeze mass trees that we have here a try the top that means this one um, that is like a shower star tight uh, plenty of water when when we have a humid period and here is growing the the the, the Christmas tree this is a very big coralloid and always they have a uh, a limit in the growing because we have here processes of evaporation, a process of condensation. So the stalagmite never touch the tri in the top. These are the same but fossilized. Also Christmas trees. And some features, general features of uh, different caves in the Egyptian cars of Sorbas. Here you have the protoconduits. And then the erosion of the marls. I think it's very clear. Some uh, candelars or candelabros, no? we say, similar to like of lechuguilla, in, not in size, of course. Some selenite crystals of the Egyptian rock. Also, we have uh, pendants and some dissolution of the of the of the floor and of the top of the galleries related with the sediments. Here, one of the of the gypsum trees. Look at this uh, slide that is uh, raining outside the cave, and is plenty of dripping water. Uh, and the possibility that the tree goes up, but never touch. Very, very nice uh, speleothems of uh, gypsum hollow stalamites, sometimes not hollow, but uh, in any case, uh, very big. We have uh, uh, a project to to try to the, that the speleologists go into these caves it goes always with the same path. Here, like a brain, very, very important, the speleothems also. This is a coralloid in reality, but very, very big. And finally, one slide of the visit of Alexander. I was there in Podolia Bukovinsky in 1990, 1990 exactly. And Alexander and, and the group of Ternopol and Kiev came to the Sorbas cars in, uh, in 1995. Here is Alexander. Here is his, his wife, Natalie. And here is his son, uh, Shasha. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thanks, John. Oh, sorry. There we are. Great. Well, thank you very much. That's, that's another fascinating area uh, and uh, a, a really interesting talk. I, and what we're seeing, it's, it's to me, between these different areas, some of the, the focus is very much there's a lot of caves. Mm. Others, we've got a lot of surface cast and no caves. So there's mm. some real contrasts between these different gypsum cast areas uh, that we're mm. seeing. So uh, very, very interesting, uh, yeah. so I say. Thank you, John. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So uh, are, are we ready now to do to look at the uh, the German cast? I'm not quite sure who's going to be giving the, the presentation, but we, we have a presentation anyway on the uh, the German gypsum cast with a focus on the uh, the South Haas region. Online. Yes, sir. Okay, good. And Okay, dann 15 Minuten für mich. Okay. Und das Mikrofon. Ja, dann habe ich angeschaltet. Okay. Okay, John, is that visible to you? Not yet, no. Ja, wahrscheinlich. Wohl eigentlich müsste er jetzt schon. Okay. 
to one is an. To one is an, yeah. Das müsste eigentlich da oben. Bildschirmpräsentation ab. Nee, du musst es ja freischalten lassen. Ja, freischalten. Okay. Das erste Mal, dass wir das machen. Ich muss jetzt nochmal ausschalten. Bildschirm freigeben, ja. ne? So, jetzt müssen wir den richtigen. Das ist halt. Ja. Genau. Jetzt. Ja. Und wenn wir den starten. Ist wieder weg da oben. Hey, das ist das ist das davor? Ja. Das ist das Zeichen, dass es ein bisschen dauert. Yeah. Okay. Is that visible now, John? Yes, that's looking good. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, we have uh, 15 minutes and uh, I did this uh, short notice because Freetard scared away. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, This is a picture, the last picture we took of uh, Klimchuk. That was last year in Vienna at the Academy where we had a nice uh, two-day session on hypogenic caves, believe it or not. Um, so that was uh, him. And I, for me, I can always uh, summarize his hypogenic work by his saying that the cave forming agent rises from below. Uh, that's enough for me. It may be water or heat or uh, CO2 or methane or H2S. All those agents rising from below uh, are those which determine hypogene cave formation. Now in Germany, we actually do have a karst almost throughout evaporite cast, I have to say, throughout the entire republic. As you can see, all what is blue is the underlying Zechstein basin, which has thousands of meters of salt and hundreds of meters of gypsum. Um, so actually entire North Germany and Central Germany can be called an evaporated cast. Even the North Sea is underlined by those layers. And there is a, is a sinkhole near Helgoland called the Helgoland Hole, which is about 40 meters deep, which is a sinkhole on top of the salt dome, which pushed up Helgoland. Uh, so even under the North Sea, you have sinkholes and karst, if you want to say so. Um, the, this is a very short review, uh, but we have several layers of uh, gypsum available throughout the Earth's history. It starts actually with the lower Permian. There is some gypsum there, but most of the, the, the thick layers, the formations are in the upper Permian, the Zechstein, where we have up to six and seven or seven uh, series in the center of the basin. But in the outcrops, we can see mostly only three or uh, four uh, series. Then in the uh, lower Triassic, the Bunsenstein, uh, we have the upper Bunsenstein, the Röd, which has uh, gypsum. Uh, following the middle Triassic, the Muschelkalk formation, we have in the middle of that, again, uh, uh, gypsum formations and salt, actually. And then the top of the Triassic uh, is the uh, Kuiper. And again, in the middle of the Kuiper, we have the Uh, Grundgips, which is also a, a, a extensive gypsum uh, area. And finally, there is some gypsum in the upper Jurassic, very local that. Uh, can I have the mouse somehow? Yeah, okay. Can... Oh. No. No. Also, ich sehe das überhaupt eine Brille nicht. Frankfurt ungefähr. Ja, aber ich brauche ihn hier. Ja, okay, forget it. Okay, you see the this uh, uh, reddish area. That is the middle Kuiper. So that's among the larger gypsum cast areas. And you see those black areas, dots actually. Those are very, very localized. Um, gypsum outcrop. So you see the outcrops of the gypsum are very small compared to the potential of the evaporite cast. 
when you go to the German geological map, which is showing what is on the surface, you have in the center, you have that uh, um, bluish red area, that's the Triassic. Uh, but the gypsum outcrops actually are hardly visible here. Most of the area, the largest area, is in fact the South Hearts, where we are here, which is about 250 square kilometers of uh, gypsum cars. The entire South Hearts is about 340 square kilometers. Um, then follows uh, the uh, uh, cast area in the, sorry, go back. Um, in the uh, Kefäuse uh, and in the Mansfeld area, those are the three largest uh, uh, Zechstein outcrops. Now we have uh, altogether uh, three show caves, which is the Segeberger cave in the, in the on top of a salt dome in Schleswig-Holstein, in this in the middle of Quaternary glacial deposits. But it's a very nice show cave showing a phreatic dissolution. Then the Heimkehle nearby here, uh, and the Barbarossa Höhle uh, in the Kefäuse. And there's one mine, which is also shown as a gypsum cave because it has large selenite crystals, uh, the Maringlas cave in uh, about 200 kilometers to the south from here. Now, the, the, the wonderful uh, areas are those where the gypsum is outcropping directly at the surface, and where you see the white rocks and you see dough lines. And here specifically, we have areas where we have uh, cows, which are uh, a specific breed from the hearts, which have been saved uh, from uh, extinction actually. And they now take care of the grass on some of the natural protection areas here. Uh, altogether, there are about uh, nearly 20 caves, which are more than 200 meters long. The total number of gypsum caves in Germany, I can't tell you, but they probably range in the number about maybe 200 or 250 caves, which are registered. Um, you see that they have a large spread in size. Um, and if you compare here the lengths and the area distribution, you see that they follow very nice uh, trend lines, which you can predict sort of if you find a new cave where it would be. Um, but actually, you also see a, a, in the. Oh, goodness, I can't. I need a. Yeah. Rechts. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. You see, here we have a kink in the whole trend line. And that is because some of the caves are. Uh, Labyrinthic, like here is a comparison between two uh, different caves, gypsum caves. One on the lower part, the Höllan, is a mace cave, as you can see. It's uh, the total length is a thousand meters, and then has about a two and a half thousand square meters. But then the other cave, which is actually the cave here where we are, uh, the Himmelreich uh, cave or, or Heaven's cave, if you want to, to, to translate that that has uh, only a length of 580 meters, but the square, the square meters, uh, the size of the cave, and the, the one large hall actually is 10,700 square meters. So it's much, much larger. So what do you want to compare in those numbers? Uh, that's always been a debate here among us, which is the largest or the longest. Actually, it would be the volumes we need to, ha to have but um, even with laser technique, it's not so easy to get exact volumes. Now, the largest caves actually, or the, the large number of caves were discovered by historic mining for the copper shale, which is the lowest formation of the Zechstein. And you see here uh, in this uh, map, those caves which are known for mining. There's only about, I think, three of them are still accessible through the mining uh, shafts. All the rest is uh, flooded or not accessible anymore. So these are historic caves of which we have some maps, but not for all. Now, the, the one which is still accessible for, the, for science is the Wimmelburger Schlotte near Mansfeld. And you see that has been intercepted by mining. And it's a relatively large system, uh, 
over two and a half, two and a half kilometers long, and it's um, apparently formed by convective water. You see the cupulars, you see the sloping side walls, and the uh, it's a typical uh, hypogene cave where the water came from below. The aquifer below is the Zechstein Kalk, and so again we have sort of double castification. First of all. We have the castification of the underlying uh, limestone, which then the, the water would rise from below into the gypsum, or better, into the anhydrite in this case, and dissolves the anhydrite from below. And then it becomes heavier and sinks back to the uh, limestone. So you have a double castification process, quite slow probably in the, in the processing. And it's only empty of water because of the mining. It would be filled in a natural circumstances all the way to the top. And there, uh, this is uh, the longest gypsum cave we have. See the numbers here: two, two kilometers, two point eight kilometers long, and nearly twenty four thousand square meters in size. But we also have large caves which are not discovered by mining and which are not below the ground. And this is, for example, the Jettenhöhle. It, it's also relatively large. You see some person standing there with a flash. And uh, uh, yeah, you would wonder how this forms. And as you see here, there is water in it. And even normally, as you can see on the lower right picture, there are pools there. And these pools are not saturated with gypsum. So again, here we have the same situation as in the Schlotten. Here the water rises from below from a very thin uh, carbonate uh, aquifer, the platendolomite. We are in the uh, Z3 series here, and this is uh, the main anhydride, as it's called. And again, here the cave forming agent comes from below, below the water. Uh, saturated with calcite, but as it rises into the gypsum, it dissolves the gypsum from underneath, like uh, butter in a pan or whatever you would like to call. Um, and then what happens then is that the cave enlarges, blocks come down which fall into the water and get dissolved. And therefore the cave now is above the water table for most of the time. But it is a hypogenic cave, even though it is at the surface of the karst uh, water table. But we also have epigenic caves, like nearby here, also the Trockstein system, which is a, 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 yeah, a, a sad case, because as you can see in the center of it, there's a big quarry. You see the yellow Trockstein cave, which is still there, but buried below. Uh, mine waste and uh, or quarry waste to be uh, correct, and you see the the creeks coming in from the from the north, um, working their way into the cave, and then all the way around, and they uh, emerge from the uh, spring system to the left, which is the Fitzmühle again a, a cave over five hundred meters long. And one of the main researchers here who did that, and Andreas Hartwig is right sitting to my side. And uh, this is pretty much his map also. Uh, and you see the, the cave creek does not just come from the Turkstein cave and then goes directly through the spring. No, it takes its turns here, as you can see, even almost closing a loop before it comes out at the Fitzmühle. And these are extremely low, but wide passages, they, um, they, they, the dissolution there doesn't go very fast because the water flows under normal circumstances on a bed of sediments. And that uh, protects the gypsum from too, too, too fast uh, dissolution. I think we need to think a little bit more about this, this sort of speleogenesis. But it's pretty much completely different from what we have seen. Different also from Park Ranch, for example, where we have water rushing through at uh, when there when there are uh, thunderstorms. But here we have a, a, a gentle little creek creeping through the mountain and doing its things over uh, hundreds or thousands of years. 
Nearby also here is Heaven's Cave. We already saw that it is a, a large hall. And this is Akilovna, historically quite interesting because it was discovered by, by, by building a train tunnel. You see the train tunnel underneath the cave here, uh, crossing uh, through the Himmelreich Ridge. And uh, they had to build the tunnel inside the cave. And you can actually, it's not quite legal, but you can walk on top of the tunnel while the train is going under your feet. It's quite an interesting feeling. Um, and you wonder how often blocks come down. And the whole um, genesis of this cave is driven by, the, by a creek which is on the left-hand side. You see here some nice pictures from inside the Etel uh, Ponor cave, which then the creek is, the, uh, is uh, originally uh, continuing into the big hall, undercutting the uh, side of the hall so that you have continuous breakdown and evolution of this enormously large hall on top, which is now on top of the tunnel. Um, and then it came back uh, to the other side, Pontel uh, Cave, and then out at the spring there. But the people from the from the train uh, company uh, were quite clever because they wanted to prevent the further growth of the cave and build a water tunnel. You see the on the right hand side um, uh, the water tunnel, which is which was drilled through the unhydride. And that diverts the creek away from the big hall so that the big hall now is relatively stable. But it's quite an interesting trip, both regarding the techniques here to stabilize the cave and the cave itself, the, the train tunnel. And you see the entrance here to the train tunnel with a very nice neo-Gothic uh, castle guard. And you see the far end of the tunnel with that little light at the end which is all what we like to see in the end, the light at the end of the tunnel. Back to the only larger cave in the uh, Kuiper. When you take, when you look at this picture, it could, picture, it could be extremely large cave, um, wherever it is. Yeah? It looks as if the, it's 20 meters wide and 10 meters high, but it isn't. This cave is just crawling. Um, but you see the interesting morphology, uh, solution cups on the ceiling. You have actually a little bit of a flat ceiling on top of it, which we call the, the solutional ceiling. And you have these characteristic sloping side walls, which we had seen also in one of the pictures with Alexander crawling through it. And this is a maze cave in shallow groundwater. I don't know if the water chemistry had been done on this, um, so I can't tell you if this is surface water standing in there, or if it is, or if it is also rising water from below. Now to wrap up, we have an extremely wide genetic diversity of caves here in Germany, starting on the the graph on the right hand side, on the upper top, you see there's a Vedos Canyon, which is which can be uh, preserved if the water table is lowered quickly. And we have one interesting cave, uh, the uh, Lichtenberg cave, which ha has yielded a lot of archeology. span That's a different talk. But anyway, it's a, it's a slot about three meters deep and 50 centimeters wide. And it clearly is a, is a, is a canyon. If you do the uh, mathematics on it, you, you can show that such a canyon would develop in, in probably less than a thousand years. So actually it should not be preserved, but it is as it is, um, you know, with this sort of uh, strange thing uh, we have in caving, we've seen very nice examples from the previous talks, what can happen in caves. Then we have this very low kind of epigenetic cave I showed you. And in the lower part there to the left is the, uh, on, the on the big graph, there is the Himmelreich uh, cave thing where the creek cuts down on the uh, sloping limestone. In the center, you see the, the uh, dissolution by uh, convective uh, dissolution, which forms this triangular cross section, uh, which then as it, as it gets too wide, like in the Mata cave, 
uh, we have 20 meter wide halls with flat ceiling, sloping side walls. And if that becomes unstable and the, the rocks fall into the water, then you the, the cave grows above the groundwater table. And like in the Yetten cave, you can then walk around on top of the sediments and on top of the breakdown blocks. And finally, you have a nice uh, sinkhole. Uh, on the right-hand side up there, you see the deep phreatic cave, which would be the uh, Mansfelder type of cave. Then there are also obviously uh, caves which are tectonic in origin. And we just heard about the bubble or the Quellungshöhen, which we have here in uh, Germany on the, on the Sachsenstein. Um, and they are maybe as large as those we have seen in Spain or a little bit uh, less in size, but they are also quite uh, valuable as a feature and some of them have collapsed and it's a, a, again a question of preserving them. Now the biggest challenge we have is preserving the area from quarrying. Here is a nice <laughs> shot from Google Earth where you see that two quarries encroach on, on a very important archaeological site with, where we have findings from the Neolithic to the, to the Middle Ages. And um, yeah, the quarrying industry would like to quarry that away, obviously. There are two uh, publications which have been uh, uh, presented in the last two years. The Mansfelder Schlotten, it's a very thick volume and I only can recommend that volume for you with lots of details on those uh, mining caves or the caves discovered by mining and, and to the right, which is more the South Hearts. Uh, as that was published last year. So there are uh, publications available to look at. And finally, I turn over to the uh, people telling us about fauna and flora. This is in a, a sinkhole in uh, Gypsum, part of the Yetten cave, which collapsed here. Uh, and there is this interesting uh, farm inside, which is, uh, typical for this sort of feature here in the South Huts. Uh, thank you for the attention. And Olaf, can you take over? Yes, I hope you can hear me. Hear you loud and clear. Uh, the pre this presentation must be closed be before I can start. Oh, I Um, I will give a short overview of, of the habitats which are on the surface of the gypsum cast and South Hearts area. Um, and starting with the forests, but uh, it's specific for our gypsum cast that are, many uh, sites are with forests. And in the best Examples just like here, we have some kind of gypsum cast wilderness with beach and ravine forests. This is in the Heinholz near the Mata Cave, a um, very natural site where there is no forestal management at all since several years. And we saw this sinkhole just before. Uh, if you see now, the, the, the fern is got. Uh, more than the former was. I think it's climate change helps this uh, Asplenium scolopendium uh, growing better than in former times because it's, it's warmer than in former times. Um, and there's no um, forest management, so it's uh, shady there. It's good for the farm. It's a special habitat type, priority habitat type of the habitat directive, uh, the ravine forest in a deep sinkhole. It's uh, the most specific uh, forest type we have in our chips of cast. Here more closer, uh, the Harztang fern, Hirschzung in German, it's Planum scolopendrium, 
an evergreen fern uh, growing in the deep sinkholes. But the most dominant uh, forest type are beech forests, uh, especially uh, Asperophagetum on base rich soils on gypsum cast. Here, an example in a very good conservation status with old trees and many much dead wood, also in the high north area. And one typical species of this habitat type is woodruff, Garium odoratum, which is typical for this habitat type 9130. Another example of this uh, beech forest, but this is outside Nature 2000. It was excluded from our, uh, from our proposal for Nature 2000 because of uh, quarry. This, uh, Forest will be destroyed by a quarry if there will not some if there will not something happening which uh, could save it. But nowadays, I think it will be destroyed. A very nice natural asparagophagetum with many sinkholes in it. This is the quarry on the other side. We look now in the opposite direction. Uh, if I can, here you see the bride in the in the uh, rear, that's the quarry, and it's the opposite direction. We look from the quarry to the forest, which will be destroyed more and more each day. Um, then we have very steep gypsum slopes uh, with another habitat type. That is the limestone beech forest or orchid uh, beech forest, uh, habitat type 9150 especially with orchids like Cephalanthera damasonium on the left, or some sedges as Carx ornithoboda on the right. One of these species, species which uh, have their most northwestern occurrence in Germany in this area here. And often the gypsum soil is acidified um, on the top. So there is no calcium at all, um, and we have no. Um, we now have the woodrush beech forest habitat 9110, which normally grows on sandstone or something like that. But if the gypsum is acidified, there is a woodrush beech forest too. Here on a bit, uh, gypsum outcrop, typical species is the white woodrush. And uh, not here in the area of um, Wagenried or Osteroda, but more in the east, uh, in the Kiffhäuser area uh, or Thuringia in the eastern part of the South Arts, we have thermophilic oak forests uh, with the habitat type 9170 with some species of Mediterranean uh, area, some such as Dictamnus albus, very nice flower or Buglosuidus purpurcerulia on the right one. It's a uh, thermophilic species, which are typical for these oak forests. So uh, now I change to the habitats of rocks and other cast features without uh, forests. The most prominent example is the Sachsenstein near Waldenried between Nackenried and Bad Sachsa. It's the biggest rocky slope uh, in gypsum cast here in Lower Saxony with more or less four, three or four habitat types of European significance with uh, chasmophytic vegetation in the fissures of the rock or pioneer vegetation on the top of the rock and screes on the bottom, on the foot of the, the scree uh, of the rocks. It's habitat type 8160 with very special plants growing there. Here's some examples as Gypsophila rapens, as the name tells us, it likes to grow on gypsum, but also on um, uh, limestone. In, it's very frequent in the Alps, but there is a very isolated site of the species far from the Alps here uh, in the area of Valkenried very special, very rare species in our region. And going a little bit in the east, we have another species of Gypsophila, Gypsophila fastigata, 
that is not an alpine species, but it's a species of, of continental steppic grassland. So we have uh, the interesting phenomenon in the Gibson cast that in the western part here, uh, Osterode, we have subatlantic vegetation, and in the eastern part, we have subcontinental vegetation. And two special species, very small ones, only growing in this site in Lower Saxony, Aralopsis petrea and Polygala amarella, very rare species only growing in the Gibson cast area. And very special are the lichen, lichen vegetation, the colorful lichen vegetation on, on Gibson rock surface, also with very special, very rare species only growing on Gibson uh, rocks outcrops. Uh, the Gibson caves we saw in the former um, presentations are very important habitats, especially for bats, just like this one. Uh, that's the main importance for nature to sound uh, as a habitat for bats. Then we have special water bodies in the Gibson cast, just the Fitzmuir spring was shown before. It's a special cast spring coming out of a cave system, which many much water at the top of, at one place. And we have smaller uh, springs just like here, which flow directly in new uh, in sinkholes, just like here, a newly caved in sinkhole, where the spring uh, disappears in the underground. Or we have temporary cast creeks, mostly without waters, and only uh, some weeks in the year there is water. And very prominent uh, example for uh, water bodies are the temporary sinkhole ponds. Uh, we uh, decided to name it Turloch. Turloch is an Irish, Irish name for temporary karstic ponds in Ireland that is um, a limestone cast, but here we have this uh, temporary sinkhole ponds and gypsum cast. It's the Ferdeteich horse pond in Heinholz. It's the biggest turloch in Lower Saxony. In um, the eastern part, we have Bauerngraben, which, which is uh, some, somewhat bigger than this one. And we have two uh, permanent cast lakes, in this case, the Chara Alge, uh, which is the, uh, some mesotrophic lakes, which belong to the habitat type 3140. That's the small Weissensee near Bad Sachsa. And we have also special uh, Gibson cast lakes in the eastern part of the Harz area with sulfurous bacteria, which is a special habitat type 3190. So the, in many, in many uh, very rare uh, habitat types are swamps or fans on, in sinkholes, which have a layer of clay on the bottom. So the rainwater cannot um, sink from there. And we have rainwater, um, rainwater lakes or ponds. And in this case, uh, with some Allium glutinosis swamp forest, which looks very, very much like uh, a forest in the, in the tropic areas. Uh, very nat naturally interesting uh, site near Nuxai. And we have uh, two uh, small fans without forests, which are important archives for peat uh, investigation to the history of this karstic area. Small fans with um, reed beds or wet grassland. And last one are the grasslands and heathlands on gypsum cast. Here's one example for the subatlantic, submediterranean, semi natural dry grasslands, the habitat type 6210 near Osterode, um, which is a pasture uh, of sheep or cattle with very interesting plants, just like orchards. Uh, on the left, the bee orchid, or on the right, we have a stepic plant, Sicily annuum, which it's only site in Lower Saxony in this area. 
And in the eastern part of the South Arts area, and especially Kiffhäuser, we have subcanonic steppic grassland, 6240 is the habitat type, um, in an area with uh, which very dry area. And typical species are just like Adonis vernalis, uh, eastern steppic species, or Steeper pennata. And very interesting, we have also Kaluna heathland on this soil where the, is acidified, just we saw it for the forests. We have all, also with out, outside the forest uh, acidified gypsum soils. Um, there we have a heathland with Kaluna and an interesting mixture of species. Kaluna is very, uh, very uh, widespread in the Atlantic region, but it's com combined with Gypsophila fastigata, which is an eastern steppe grassland species. So that's a very unique form from dry heath in the Egyptian cast. And at least we have um, gypsum cast with a layer of uh, clay on it. So that is not as dry as we saw before. There we have species rich lowland hay meadows, in this case with scrub and solitary trees, very nice area near Osterode. Um, this uh, species rich grassland has become quite rare in Lower Saxony because of intensive agriculture. We have very nice flowers there, just like Leucanthemum or Anunculus species. Okay, that was a short overview of the vegetation and the habitat types on our gypsum cast. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olaf, and, and thank you, Stefan. I, just, just one thing I, uh, I'm a, a little confused by because uh, I, uh, I, I, I listed the, the Haas Geopark as one of the only geoparks that's got gypsum, but you, neither of you have mentioned the geopark in your presentations. Where where does the geopark uh, fit into the protected areas, protected gypsum areas in Germany? Uh, I don't know, but uh, Friedhard, can you das erklären mit dem Geopark? So we have Nature 2000 areas, which does not uh, have something to do with, with the geopark. It's a different thing. No. Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. So the answer is very easy. The uh, geopark, I gave you an email, John, on the geopark hearts, etc. It's not a large protected area. It's not in PA. It's just a UNESCO geopark without immediate protection function. So that what is protecting here is the FFH areas, Olaf spoke about it, et cetera, and the natural protection areas, uh, the NSGs in German, but the geopark is just something like a, a, a nice to have, but it's not a PA protected area. Yeah, no, thank you. I, 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 wanted, uh, I wanted everybody to, to, to hear that because it's, it's really quite important because we, we class the geoparks, the UNESCO global geoparks are classed as international protected areas. And so if what you're saying is that the, the gypsum within the geopark is not protected, then that is significant um, for the, the whole essence geopark program. Uh, and uh, I, I, uh, I just wanted everybody to to, to hear and understand that. That's important what you say. Maybe one more remark. Olaf didn't talk about the biosphere reserve cast uh, South Arts. This is the uh, third of our area in, in Lower Saxony, in Saxony Anhalt. And this is uh, a PA. So it works in natural protection and it's got a law, but the geopark has no law. We will discuss these things tomorrow more intensive. But in German, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, that's that's that is one for you to discuss. But this for the uh, for for what's ho hopefully a a more international audience. 
Okay, well that, that that was that was very interesting to see. I'm I'm hoping I th some of you know to go to go over and visit that area in July uh, and visit some of the caves. So I'll be very interested to to see it. I, I think we we we've sort of run around the program a little bit, but the uh, the the last speaker for this session uh, is is going to move us on another area of fauna, the the subterranean fauna in uh, an Egyptian cast area. Uh, Monteconca uh, area in Sicily. Uh, so uh, Giuseppe Nicolosi, uh, look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, hello, thank you. Okay, I'll share my presentation. Can you see it? Yes, yes, that's fine. Okay, thank you. And thank you for the invitation. Uh, so I uh, would like to talk about the results of the investigation we perform in Monte Conca Gypsum Cave, which is located in Sicily. Uh, I start with a very brief introduction about gypsum in Italy, even if I'm not a geologist. So, uh, so basically, gypsum crops out basically in almost all regions, and they represent about one percent of the national territory. But the most extensive area you can see here on the map are in Emilia Romagna and in Sicily in particular with more than 1,000 square kilometers. And here in particular, we found more than 200 caves and Monte Conca is one of them, probably one of the most important in Sicily. Uh, so Monte Conca cave is here located in the middle of Sicily. So we are in the province of Castanissetta. Uh, around the homonymous relief, uh, which is about 400 meters height. And so this is where the cave develops. So basically it's a, a sinkhole. Uh, so there is the water of a river that goes into the cave uh, through the terminal gallery, which the other side of the mountain, where there is another cave that we call Palio Resurgenza, from where the water uh, flow out. Uh, so this area is very interesting, geologically speaking. And so the gypsum here formed during the Mycenaean salinity crisis. So basically the rocks belong to the Seria Gestoso Sulfifera outcrop. And because of the very important uh, geological area, because of the landscape, but also for the presence of very interesting fauna and flora, it was established as a natural reserve uh, since 1995. So let's have a look to the cave survey. So I told you it's a sinkhole, so it develops vertically at the beginning. There are several shafts of different length. And then there is this uh, terminal gallery of 200 meters long. And the total development of this cave is about, is more than 2.5 kilometers, and the total depth is 130 meters. And so I told you it's a um, natural reserve, and in particular, a strict natural reserve. So it means that it's only visited for a scientific purpose, and it's also a geosite of interesting. But what is very peculiar about this cave, what is very interesting is that here, after the terminal gallery, we can find uh, a very unique habitat. We find we can find uh, two sulfidic pools of different sides. This one you can see in the picture is the, the big one. And so this uh, sulfidic habitat is, it can be more or less isolated from the water and running from outside. In fact, basically we can distinguish two different uh, seasons, a wet season and a dry season. So during the uh, wet season, there is this big amount of water that goes through the cave. It's the water of the river and it is a tributary of the Galodoro stream. So it flow through the cave, it reach the terminal gallery to the sulfidic habitat. Of course, during this period, it's a bit complicated to reach the cave because of the large amount of water. And during the dry season, instead, uh, the cave is, is dry. There is no, you can see in the picture, there is no longer water flowing through the, the caves. And But this period lasts um, generally from June or September or July and September 
of course it changes every year depending on the amount of precipitation. Um, so uh, Monte Gong is very interesting, of course, for the geological setting, but also from a biological point of view. But there were very few information about the fauna living in this habitat. So that's why we started our investigation. So the first aim was to investigate the, the presence of the fauna living in this uh, community, in, in this habitat, in particular in the sulfidi habitat. And also a uh, previous investigation uh, identified the presence of sulfur bacteria. So we uh, were wondering if the sulfur bacteria could uh, um, somehow uh, influence the presence of the invertebrate community. And of course, uh, we started this investigation also because we wanted to identify any possible threats that could affect this fragile ecosystem. So uh, what we did is, first of all, we tried to characterize the habitat. In particular, we performed some uh, chemical and physical analysis. So we measured the pH, the sulfide concentration in the water, the temperature in the water, and the cave and the hair. And uh, concerning the biological aspects, we study the fauna living in both sulfidic and non sulfidic habitat during the dry and also the wet season. So we avoid the, the use of pitfall trap uh, because during the wet season it was very hard and so we could not place a trap because there was too much water. So we just studied uh, visual sensors. Uh, so basically we recorded the presence of all the species we detect during the, the progression. And we also perform some stable isotope ratio analysis. I will explain a bit why. And we also did some uh, genetic analysis in collaboration with the South Florida, South Florida University, uh, because we wanted to study the diversity, the microbial diversity living in sulfur waters. So why we, we did the stable isotope ratio analysis? So uh, because we wanted to understand if our community, the community living in, in the sulfur water was supported, was energetically independent, or not. meaning we wanted to understand if the fauna was supported only by the carbon that was arriving from outside, so the carbon that is originated by photosynthesis, or uh, this community was also supported by the sulfur bacteria. So the carbon that is autochronous produced by chemiosynthesis. And this is possible because this analysis allowed to understand the source of carbon and nitrogen in a sample. If we can understand if it was produced by photosynthesis or chemiosynthesis. Uh, sulfur bacteria, in fact, are chemiosynthetic organisms, so they don't use the energy of the sun, uh, but instead they use the energy derived from uh, some chemical reaction. And generally they are rich in carbon that is isotopically lighter. So it means that we can distinguish based on this value from photosynthetic organism. Uh, it will be more clear after we show you the, the results. So uh, what about the sulfide concentration? Um, so, as we expected, we observed a very high concentration of sulfur, but only in the sulfidy habitat and in particular during the dry season in August. Uh, on the other side, in non sulfidy habitats, the concentration was very uh, low uh, during the wall sampling activity. And so, uh, what about fauna then? So, we observed uh, uh, that were, there was a clear difference in terms of weakness, uh, in terms of diversity. So let's have a look to the number. Um, so first of all, we detect uh, more than 50 species, but most of them were not subterranean species, meaning they are they were not strictly uh, species that live in a subterranean habitat, but most of them actually, they were arriving from outside together with the water of the stream. 
And in particular, well, as we expected, uh, the number was higher during the wet season, both in sulfidic and non-sulfidic habitat. But in particular, during the dry season, what is, was very interesting is that the number was higher. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so was higher uh, in the sulfidic habitat, both in the wet and the dry season. Uh, so basically, there should be something that supports this higher diversity compared to non-sulfidic habitats. Uh, this is something that we will see with the uh, isotope analysis. Uh, but let's have a look to the sulfidic habitat. This is something we, we can see uh, where um, when the uh, sulfidic habitat, the water of the sulfidic pool is very dry. So there is, uh, well, the level of the water is very low. These white are mostly bacteria. You can see this like filament form of bacteria. And it was very interesting that we uh, only here, only in this habitat, we observed many species, but uh, very abundant, so like this. Uh, two effects of this Nepa cinelia. So I will give you some information about some species. Uh, for instance, the two effect Vancardi here in the sulfur water, only in this habitat, was very abundant. So we detect this uh, big cluster of two effects uh, living all together, but only in the sulfur water. And this could be explained by the characteristic of the species. For instance, we know from the literature that two effects is able to survive in an environment that is highly polluted, where the, lox and the oxygen is very low, and it's also capable to live in water where the sulfide concentration is, is very high. So this is the reason why we can find it here. And the reason why it's so abundant could be explained by the fact that the bacteria represent a primary food source for this species. And a similar uh, thing uh, we observe for this species, Nepa cinerea. So also this species is not subterranean, meaning we can find it even outside. And in fact, we observed Nepa both in the sulfidic and non-sulfidic habitat, but only here the abundance was very high. Also, this species is able to uh, tolerate high level of pollution, high level of sulfur, and in fact, uh, here, uh, as I said, it was very abundant. And we observed uh, many uh, specimens during uh, matings, and also we observed the presence of several larvae. So, meaning that the species here in this cave is able to. Uh, develop its entire cycle within the within the cave, and also we observe that the specimen living in the sulfur water presents this sulfur bacteria on the cuticle. So basically, this uh, specimen live here for for a long time. So they are resident in the sulfur waters. Another interesting uh, species uh, is this spider uh, called Lesertia barbara. So in Italy, it's only recorded in Sicily, and in Monte Conca and another gypsum cave in Trapani, and also distributed in other countries like Spain and Morocco and Alger Algeria. Uh, but it's particular that in all these locations, we know that there is at least the vicinity of sulfur spring water. So for this species, it seems to be important, it seems to be related to this kind of habitat. And also, what is, what's very curious, we observe a very high abundance of spiders near the sulfur water. Uh, they were moving in the spider webs. So we saw this drop. Uh, at the beginning, we thought it was just water. And then we measure the pH, and we found a pH of about one because it was actually sulfuric acid. But they don't care about it; they just move around, and they even put the cocoon with the heads, and they were like covered of sulfuric acids. So they are not actually <laughs> disadvantaged in this extreme condition. So uh, what about the results of the isotopes? So uh, 
Basically, we observe the clear separation between the sample we analyze in non-sulfidic habitat and that one in the sulfidic one. Uh, so uh, here, non-sulfidic habitats, uh, most of the sample present a delta value of about minus 20 and minus 25. So the carbon here is isotopic heavier, me meaning that it's produced uh, outside by a photosynthetic activity. This is something we expected, of course. But what about the sulfur gas habitat? Here, the carbon was actually isotopically lighter. So meaning that this is our autochthonous uh, carbon. And what is interesting is that the animal like the two bifex plancardi that we suggest before present a value that was very negative. So meaning that this one has a to hit the bacteria. So the answer of the previous question is yes. So there is the support of the sulfur bacteria or the chemosynthetic activity of the sulfur bacteria. So um, recently we, we try to do also other sampling uh, activity, but we could not enter in the cave we, even during the dry season. Because what we observe is that because of the agriculture activity, uh, there is no longer a clear separation between the dry and the wet season because the agriculture activity are altering the natural regime of the water. And also, this is also favoring the entrance of several contaminants, I will show you in a bit. And this is, of course, is very concerning because as we saw before, it's, it is very important for the invertebrate community having a, a period of, that is dry because they need uh, the high concentration of sulfur for, for the blooming or weakness of species. And so I told you we, we did also some genetic uh, analysis. So this is our, uh, the result. Um, so um, this is what happened during the dry and the wet and the transition period. So during the dry season, uh, there is no water that arrived from you know, outside. And what we observed is that most uh, bacteria are sulfur bacteria, as we expected, of course. But what is concerning is that during the wet season, when there is the water arriving from outside, most of the bacteria are actually of anthropogenic, uh, anthropogenic origin. So meaning they are from uh, the industry activity or the agriculture activity. If we look more in details to this data, uh, this is what happened during the dry season. So in, uh, in July, we observe more than 90% of sulfur bacteria. In August, they were about 90%. And they mostly belong to the genus Theovirga and Sulfurorum, which are in fact those uh, genus of bacteria very common in other uh, sulfur cave in Italy and other locations. But what happened in the dry, in the wet season? During the wet season, during the transition period, we have about 70% of, of microbes of anthropogenic origin. But uh, in the wet season, they are almost 90%. We analyze also this one, and we observe that more than 80% of these bacteria are Escherichia, the genus Escherichia, which are uh, pathogens like Escherichia coli, for example. So this is, of course, <laughs> it is very bad for the community living in Monte Conca and the entire ecosystem. And if we look the reservation course, uh, what we observe is that the rhythms change according to the season. So the higher rhythms uh, was here during the dry, the wet and transition period, but as we so already they are basically uh, pathogens. But during the dry season, the level of weakness is lower. But this is normal because they are basically the sulfur bacteria like Theovirga. But uh, again, uh, what the, our uh, results suggest is that, uh, well, of course, this Monte Conca is very important site, both 
from the biological point of view, also geo geological one, but also because it's one of the few spots in the world where we can find sulfur water within the, within the caves. But uh, of course, it's in danger for several reasons. First of all, the agriculture activity, because it's altering the natural regime of the water, but also the now we have more frequent uh, extreme weather events. So this is also altering the natural regimes. And of course, it's, it represents a real threat for the invertebrate community. And as I already said, in the period that is dry. No? And of course, as we saw, uh, this is also favoring the entrance of several contaminants. They represent a, a danger not only for the human health, but also for the invertebrate community living in Monte Kong. So, um, so in conclusion, what we saw with our investigation is that the cave protection is not actually effective if anthropogenic impacts alter the land use over land cave. So um, what we be important in Sicily, in Italy, in other locations, we need to focus not only in the management of the cave, but also uh, the area overlying the cave, because it will be also very important. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, another very interesting presentation and your point you. at the end yeah. about managing it. It's the, the land over, over the top, but also the catchment, because one of the uh, the problems in, uh, yeah. in many yeah. of our protected areas is that the land over the top of the cave is protected, but the catchment is not. So the, the allergy yeah, exactly. waters flow in. So I think you're... you're the other theme I think that comes out is, is of course, when Kyung Sik was saying that within the, the cave, we, we need to be looking at both the geo and the bio. And yeah. uh, that came out there. You, your focus obviously was on the bio, but I was looking at some of those pictures and thinking there's some lovely morphology down there, some very interesting cave from yeah. a, a geo point of view. So, yeah, yeah th thanks very much for that. Thank you. Okay. So I uh, I think that's the the end of our uh, our morning uh, morning our, our first session. Uh, we have a break now, um, and uh, then uh, at uh, at quarter quarter past uh, uh, qu sorry quarter to five in your time, uh, we move on to uh, cave and gypsum protection in Europe, uh, and I hand over as moderator to uh, Jean Claude Tice. So, uh, yeah, thank yes. you to all the speakers in this session and uh, uh, we'll see you later. Uh, Barbel, have you, you anything else you wanted to add? Yeah, yes, uh, I just want uh, to add um, the things I got from the YouTube channel. Um, and there were, um, Ferdinando uh, was referring to Jose Maria's talk and he's hoping that Jose Maria's uh, project uh, of defining paths in some caves uh, will go ahead. And uh, we had many thumbs up. And uh, I think in the second part, we had uh, 13 people uh, online watching us on YouTube. But I'm sure that there will be many more uh, for downloads afterwards. That's all from the YouTube side. <laughs> And uh, thank you to Nadia and Ferdinando for your nice greetings. Greetings back to you. <laughs> Likewise. Okay. Thank you. We take our break now. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Robak, Mirit, and thank you for all of those brilliant uh, presentations. They will help us very much uh, tomorrow, at least for our discussions in Germany. Thank you and uh, see you later. <laughs>
Wir können es. Hallo Georg, bist du da? Können wir dich was fragen? Das wird, das, es wird, wir sind aber immer noch live. Ja, ähm, das macht ja nichts. Wir fangen ja in fünf Minuten, sieben Minuten wieder an. Ja. Die Frage ist, äh, wir haben gerade versucht, den Bildschirm zu teilen. Mhm. Und wie macht man das, dass wir nicht wieder diese Präsentationsmode haben? Also, dass wir nicht wieder zwei Folien ja. sehen, sondern nur einen. Äh, ich glaube, eigentlich müsstet ihr nur das Bild nochmal anklicken. Also ich, hab, ich bin jetzt zwar nicht ganz bei PowerPoint nicht ganz so fit, aber ähm, das, das sind ja zwei Bilder. Und wenn man das, das Bild noch anklickt. Genau. Ja, das ist ja nicht PowerPoint. Das, das habe ich doch vorhin gemacht. Nee, du hast das. das glaube ich nicht. Ja, aber trotzdem das. Lass das mal und jetzt gucke ich mal. Jetzt, jetzt sieht es gut aus. Ist es jetzt nur einer? Jetzt Quark. ist nur einer. Tip top, so machen okay, wir das. Gut. Lass mal. Ich lasse das jetzt einfach so. Ja, wunderbar. <lacht> Ja, da wäre er auch schon. Deshalb müsste ich das jetzt noch einbauen. <lacht> Alle haben noch schnell solche Bilder gesucht. Ja, ja. Es wurde ja völlig ausgebildet. Ja, wenn das der deutsche Verband damals in Nordrhein Nordrhein ja. und und nach der Bände eingeladen ah, Ja, das war eine ja, das, das, war das, das wurde ja, ja hier von diesen ganzen Ausbildungen. Wir waren ja die Ersten, die irgendwie Mal in den Westen. Alle, haben das, alle waren die Ersten, die nach in den Westen, nach Italien. Ja, da warst du, warst du nicht da, aber der, bei der deutsch-österreichischen in Bonn. Ähm, ich bin richtig froh, dass wir in Berlin so einen Newsletter haben. Du vergisst den nicht für ein paar Tage. Das vergisst du einfach. Und der Mann macht nur noch mal das so. Und dann schiebe ich mich nicht mehr. Das letzte Treffen mit der Landfarbe dabei war. Das war das Rechtsfall. Und, ähm, ja, der Sonne, 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 der Mach mal hier den Ton aus. Mach mal hier den Ton aus. Hier. Das ist mir nicht da.
it's ja hallo Oder muss ich da oben gucken? Ich glaube, eigentlich müsste das. Und sagen, aber da waren diese zwei Bildschirme da. Ja, wenn ich jetzt runterdrücke, dann drücke ich auch so. Warum sieht man das in Präsentation jetzt hier? Weiß ich nicht. Mal da unten da sind wir doch, musst du doch nur anschalten da. Also. Ja, du musst die nehmen, wo du dran bist, oder? Wo du geteilt hast, sonst tust du ja die andere machen. Nee, die andere. Na, okay. okay. Guck mal weiter und guck, ob es weitergeht von. Ja, geht. Bist du laut gestellt? Hört man es. Uh, can everybody hear me? Ja, alles gut. Yes, welcome back to this uh, second session of the uh, Gypsum. Uh, car symposium here in uh, Valkenried and online. Now we move away from uh, the geological part and uh, move more into a political part of the of the presentations. But as this uh, symposium is dedicated to Alexander Grimchuk, I wanted uh, to show you uh, one picture more of him. And as I am uh, coming from Luxembourg, I have a picture where He was in 1992 in uh, the largest uh, maze cave in uh, Luxembourg, which is four and a half kilometers wide. And uh, he was very fascinated as it looks nearly exactly the same as uh, his uh, research cave uh, in the Ukraine. So this is long ago and we all were much younger at that time. Cave protection, uh, I am... Uh, Actually, the president of the European Cave Protection Commission of the European Speleological Federation, and I uh, wanted to present you this commission and the work of it. So at the time, many, many years ago, there was a cave and there was uh, maybe human beings, maybe not yet at the time. And then slowly the human being started to enter into the caves, leaving some, well, we would call it Nastly now uh, graffiti, but it's a very valuable graffiti that has been uh, put on the walls by our uh, predecessors. Today, we are entering the caves as well. The human being is leaving again, stuff inside the caves, but this is not so nice. So uh, all this uh, has uh, put us to the thinking that we need Uh, European Cave Protection Commission because cave protection was not really organized uh, in uh, Europe at this time. So it was in 90, uh, it was in 2007 in the Baltic Spheological Congress where we had, uh, as the time it was the Fédération Spéléologique de l'Union Européenne, uh, we integrated the European Cave Protection Commission for the first time. There were a couple of enthusiasts that made this possible. And through all these years, uh, Cave Protection has changed its team every four, four years. And uh, now recently, the last time we changed the team uh, was now a week ago during the Eurospelia Forum. And currently we have 17 members from 12 countries which work for the Cave Protection Commission. 
This uh, is a session which uh, will go from 23 to 27. What uh, has the Cave Protection Commission done in all those years? There are uh, a couple of interesting uh, things. So we have introduced European Cave Day. We uh, put in place the Eurospelio protection label, which every year gives a prize to a good uh, project uh, in cave and cast protection. We have uh, introduced the Eurospelio protection symposium since 2008. There is a cleanup uh, the dark uh, project, which the European Cave Protection Commission is uh, hosting. Then uh, we put uh, in place uh, white nose uh, syndrome and shale gas uh, fact sheets. We have introduced the protection charter and already early in the beginning in 2008, uh, also prior people from the Cave Protection Commission were in Brussels uh, to promote cave protection as a cultural and natural environment heritage in the European Union at that time. We start with the Cave Protection Commission's uh, uh, protection label, which is being given every year since 2010. It is a form of uh, currently 800 euros a year for the project and also a gear item from one of the FSE sponsors, which is either Scurion from Switzerland, AV from France or Corda Scopes from Spain. The last uh, winner of the protection label has been the Cox Biological Group from Ireland, uh, which are digging into the past uh, with uh, cave exploration and arche archaeological finds. Here's a small overview of those uh, projects. On top left, uh, you will see uh, the Cave Life app uh, from uh, Germany, which has won the prize in 21. There is cave cleaning activities to 2018. In the middle, the, the green spot, that's actually a renaturation of a uh, karstic spring in Austria. There was a concrete uh, uh, reservoir, which has been taken out. And the spring is uh, again, as it has uh, been uh, 50 years before. Uh, another interesting project was 22 uh, Italian projects for the microplastic pollution in, in cave waters. They have uh, introduced uh, ideas on how to filter out uh, for, uh, for monitoring. And uh, the latest projects on the right, you see the bones which are uh, left in the caves, and these are reindeer bones actually in Ireland. In 2008, uh, there was a team uh, from many cavers from uh, all over Europe and also from the Protection Commission uh, going to Brussels for a couple of days and uh, trying to uh, protect the caves on, on the invitation of a, of a Basque Spanish uh, uh, politician. And uh, there was a hearing also in the, in the major auditor at that time. We introduced uh, slowly the trend principles for cave and cast protection in Europe, which actually everybody knows, but uh, new cavers uh, sometimes need to have uh, this in mind uh, when they go in caves. And also it is always welcome if people remember this. Uh, the white nose syndrome I have told you is not uh, it is present in Europe, but it is not killing the bats, as we know, uh, but we have uh, done a fact sheet on, on this. And uh, one of the results is that nowadays we are speaking in the Cave Protection uh, Commission also about uh, motivating people to clean up their gear and, and, and especially overalls and shoes when they actually go to caves other, in other regions, in other countries uh, or other continents, which is very, very important. We had sent uh, a letter to the European uh, Commission uh, on, uh, on the impacts of shale gas extraction on the on, on environment and on the human health. We actually got a reply from the, from the Brussels Commission that energy is uh, a country-based uh, so, and not actually uh, European based, uh, so this was 
not very successful, but I don't know if if this could eventually be a case in the future when uh, we need to search for other uh, energy sources. I told you about uh, Clean Up the Dark. This is actually a project between Croatia, Slovenia and Italy. And uh, here on the map, you will see the red dots that are all wasted caves or polluted caves from all kinds. Uh, there is normal household waste in these caves, but also in, in, in uh, the former Eastern uh, uh, countries, there is a lot of uh, weapons and other stuff, uh, chemical products, which can be found in caves and which need to be uh, taken out by special means. And this all costs very much. So up to now in the Swiss states, 228 caves have been cleaned. And uh, we hope that uh, other motivated people will clean up uh, more in the, in the future. You can uh, find this uh, at cleanupthedark.org. Uh, the Eurospelio Protection Symposium has been inaugurated in 2008 at the French uh, Congress at the time in Vercors. And since then we had already six uh, uh, symposiums. They were all over Europe up to now and uh, which gained more and more uh, importance. Usually they were together with uh, organ organizations of national congresses or international congresses. But the last uh, symposium uh, was uh, organized on its own uh, together with the uh, BFN uh, from Germany. The titles of these symposiums were very divided and uh, we have passed through the heritage preserving to the uh, uh, science and cave protection. And the latest one was uh, actually on the assessing, monitoring and protecting cave biotopes and geotopes through Natura 2000 or similar programs in Europe, uh, similar programs, uh, this is the Emerald sites in non-EU countries, which actually have uh, similar uh, monitoring processes, but are not actually Natura 2000 areas. So this uh, last symposium was on Wilm Island in the north of uh, Germany here. And it was a hybrid uh, conference because it was still in, in this uh, pandemic times. Uh, so there was a part of the team was actually on the island and other uh, stood home uh, in front of their monitor. It was a very successful uh, symposium and a synopsis uh, can be found on the European Cave Protection Commission's uh, site. There is already uh, a next symposium, which will be the seventh, and it will be in Slovakia, right in the Slovakian paradise, near uh, the famous Bis uh, castle, which you see at the left uh, bottom. And uh, the topic will be all about water, ice water, groundwater, cave water, cast waters, uh, and this area is well, well situated uh, for this topic. So it will be in 24, not in 23. Cleaning caves uh, is uh, actually a very important part because everywhere in Europe, uh, there is always some waste, even if it's uh, some, some dead animals that a farmer has thrown in or just uh, waste. And it is also a very imp important part uh, the caves actually uh, suffer a lot uh, when they clean up caves. In Italy, a girl has been contaminated by some chemical products some years ago, so it's not uh, uh, very kind. Uh, another important part of the European Cave Protection Commission is uh, EU cave politics. And uh, here you see at the top right, there is a 2008 when they went to, to Brussels for the protection uh, of the caves and they distributed uh, spaghetti uh, just to tell the people that in caves, a lot of stalactites are uh, spaghetti-like uh, and they actually didn't knew that. And then on the, on the bottom right and on the left uh, is uh, when the, the German Federation got the Natura 2000 prize uh, last year in, in Brussels. We had a talk with the DG Environment uh, Director, uh, uh, Florica Fink Hoyer, and also with uh, Jutta Paulus, which we will uh, hear tomorrow 
in the second day of this symposium. Uh, the FSE, the European Biological Federation, is a full member of the European Environmental uh, Bureau, which is based in Brussels since 2011. We are a full member. Uh, beside as well the, the German Federation and also the Italian uh, Caving Federation. So we are three uh, national for the world, three organizations uh, by, uh, working on cave protection uh, in the EEB. The EEB is uh, a network of environmental civil organizations, has 100, 180 organizations uh, in 40 countries, which are member. And uh, the ECPC, uh, which is uh, actually uh, doing the representation for the Federation, is a member of the EB Council since 2015. But it's not just being member, the EEB's uh, more important uh, steps are actually in the working groups. Here you see Bebel uh, and myself with the current uh, president uh, three weeks ago in, uh, in Stockholm. So it's the working groups which, which are the more important uh, uh, parts of the EEB because their uh, cave protection is uh, uh, deal, dealt in uh, biodiversity working groups, in water, working groups, soil, law and justice, and international environmental governments. Uh, in these working groups, uh, papers are uh, discussed and also uh, the work program is being discussed and uh, the long time strategy of the EB. And uh, since many years, we try to get in uh, more uh, about the groundwater and uh, protection because caves are actually unknown uh, to many people. And very recently, uh, we are also observer at the Raw Materials Civil Society Coalition which is uh, not the direct working group of the EEB, but it's a uh, surveying of many organizations dealing with um, uh, materials, raw materials, mainly metals. And so we came uh, now into that and asked what is about minerals. And uh, there are not so many organizations working on minerals. So uh, here as well, we, we, we are nearly the first ones to ask this and uh, we will see how this will uh, develop in the future. And uh, regarding the current situation here in, uh, in the hearts, uh, the European Cave Protection Commission has sent a letter to the Lower Saxony Ministry of Nutrition, Agriculture, and Consumer Protection, protesting against the plans uh, to uh, to give permission for the the, the gypsum extraction here in the Harz. Uh, this was March 21. We are now two years later. We still haven't got an answer from them, and uh, it was written in paper form, and we should actually got get one, but. Nobody replied. Other open letters uh, that uh, the Commission has written uh, is about the EU needs to act urgently in protecting and restore soils. Uh, sorry, there is some uh, conversion uh, problems. Uh, we have uh, sent a, a letter uh, against uh, the, the development of new hydropower uh, in Europe, where we speak about more than 1,500 hydropower uh, dams uh, all over Europe. The restoration law is an issue. And uh, again, the, the soil health soil, uh, law, which uh, should be pushed uh, further urgently in, in Europe. When the, uh, the Germans got the Natura 2000 prize last year, we took the occasion and handed over a, a position paper together with the Verband der Deutschen Hülden und Karstforscher uh, on the uh, integration of the geodiversity into the European protection policy. And uh, we actually got a letter, also a nice letter in return. They do it, the Germans don't. Uh, but it was not really satisfying for the moment. So the ECPC actually also tries to be more in contact with ICN, OGEO, and Eurovets for uh, different uh, topics. And uh, 
we have now a lot of people that can handle a lot of projects. So we actually bring light into the dark stories and we would like uh, to have your projects as well uh, in case of the protection label or other ideas. Um, I thank you very much. Well, um, I would like to introduce now our next speaker, which uh, is also present here on location, which is the Alexander Just from the European Commission. And uh, he will uh, talk us on, on the Natura 2000 or the, the yeah, what is the exact, <laughs> sorry. He will uh, speak us on the, on the Natura Uh, yeah. Sides. Yeah. I hand over the microphone. Sorry when it, it makes some noise. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Das Mikro nicht direkt vom Mund, sondern hier auf der Seite. Das ist schon so. so okay. Können Sie mich gut verstehen? Ich will es noch jetzt an. Jetzt. Ah, ja. Können Sie mich gut verstehen? Ton ist gut. Vielen Dank. Ich bin schon so weit, nee, ne? Ja. Bildschirmpräsentation, erster Punkt. Ja. Das. Ja, thank you very much. Um, thank you also for the invitation um, to be present here today. My name is Alexander Jus. I work for the European Commission um, in the Director General Environment and here in the unit Nature Protection. In my uh, presentation, I would like to introduce you to these habitat type caves, not open to the public. I'm sorry, it's the name like that. I will explain the appropriate assessments according to Article 6.3 on conservation objectives. Um, and here we'll explain uh, with some examples how a project have to be assessed if a natural resource site is concerned. And last but not least, there are of course to all regulations, derogations and if this is applied, how uh, the damage can be compensated. My <clears throat> first part is now introducing the habitat type caves not open to public, because the spe speciality here is that in the habitat directive, we have a protected feature, which is exactly uh, your main interest, which are caves. And uh, these caves are clearly defined. Okay, so my presentation is more interesting than myself. <laughs> but thank you for the uh, presentation of it. But we will fix it. Thank you very much for the technical and the support here. <clears throat> Once again. <laughs> okay, I don't need to repeat what I said already. Uh, the slide should just support uh, what I explained. So um, I wanted to introduce this habitat type 8310, 
which means this is part in the Habitats Directive. And each member state uh, was requested to uh, put uh, a certain number of these habitat types into the Natura 2000 network. Uh, this definition is uh, provided from European level. And you see, um, let's see if I have a cursor here. No, I don't, but doesn't matter. Um, if you look at the bottom, uh, point three and point four, um, that uh, there is a direct link to a national uh, definition, which was um, which was um, provided by Germany and by Belgium, which was point number five. Um, to give you now a clear understanding what this means, this is a kind of framework now, how this habitat type is um, defined. And this definition is then implemented by the member states according to their needs, which means they can go much broader, but they cannot go smaller in the definition. And I now wanted to um, sh um, check how <coughs> Germany is doing it. Um, and here we have um, a copy, uh, a screenshot of the Federal Agency of Nature Protection, the BFN, which is on behalf of Germany reporting each six years the conservation status of each of these protected habitat types. Well, and one of them is now case. And um, in this booklet, um, which is now from two years ago, um, you see in the left corner how the conservation status is um, analyzed by different member states. Green means uh, good conservation status. Yellow means, well, not good but not 100% bad, which would be red. And you see there even, there's even one member state, Spain, saying, I'm sorry, we don't know. We have still to investigate. One member state, one in the north, says we don't have this habitat type at all. Um, this assessment is done by the member states. So it's not the commission who is now analyzing all these uh, protected features. So this is data provided by the member states. And um, as it is public and officially done by the responsible ministries, is of course a part of um, internal scientific discussion. Now, going back to Germany, uh, you see that in these three biogeographic regions for which Germany is responsible, which is the Alpine, it's a small narrow strip. Um, on the, in the south of Bavaria. Then we have the continental region, which is the main middle part. And we have the Atlantic region. Germany reported that for the Atlantic region, this habitat type doesn't exist. In the continental region, Germany says it's in a good favor status. So there's an, uh, enough number of um, protected uh, of this habitat type. Um, it's in a good conservation status and also the future perspective is good. And there is currently no main threat uh, against this habitat type. And more or less the same is uh, applying for the um, Alpine region. Um, in my next slide, I would now like to show you how this habitat type now for which the member state is responsible has to be managed. And here I would like to explain you by some theoretical uh, projects, um, how a member state would uh, follow this, um, um, that the project cannot um, affect uh, the protected feature. First of all, I would like to introduce the basic principle of the so-called Article 6 of the Habitats Directive, which means, which is the management of this Natura 2000 network. Again, always keep in mind um, 
a certain habitat type or a certain species. And this you can more or less translate now in my abstract uh, explanation. The first part is mentioned, and I think this is one of the um, major improvements for nature protection, is the Article 6.1, which means the member state is responsible to either bring the protected feature in a good conservation status, or if this is already, already happened, um, uh, has to keep it. So this is a concept which means if you have a protected site, it's not enough to just protect it. it the, the article says clearly, you have to be actively doing something to bring this in a good conservation status, or if it is already, um, that uh, it stays there. Uh, for this, member states introduced management plans, which should clearly uh, identify what is needed um, for the protected features uh, to be in a good conservation status. <coughs> These management plans are linked to the conservation objective of a site, which means each site has a certain objective which should be achieved uh, for those protected features which are present. Now, going to Article 6.2, which is maybe more common because it's a normal common understanding, it says the member state should ensure that uh, the protected features cannot be destroyed, the non deterioration principle. Rather easy. Um, everybody understands that the nature protection site should not be destroyed. Now, as the European directives um, are flexible, uh, there is also now a certain Article 6.3 and 6.4, which means, first I go for 6.3, any plan or any project in the site or which could have a cause into the site must run an appropriate assessment to check if it causes a significant effect on the protected features. I give you a certain example. Let's imagine you have um, a protected site and you would like to build a highway through. Um, because of uh, big, dis uh, big uh, destroying, uh, it's obvious that this project would cause a significant effect. And therefore, I just now follow until Article 6.3, is not possible to introduce. Let's go for another example. You are building or you are you would like to allow um, a mine or a quarry, which is outside the protected site, but because of uh, heavy uh, disruption of the groundwater, this effect would now affect the protected features in the site, which is maybe five kilometers away. Here again, this project caused a significant effect and therefore there is a certain problem. I have shown this in a flow chart, which maybe um, gives you a better understanding. So with number one, you have the project and now you assess it in the form of a screen. I again give you an example. Let's imagine um, you have a cave which is protected and now the authority, I with not broken, would like to fix a sign with a drill on the entrance of the cave. Someone could say, oh my God, there is somebody with a drill uh, going into the rock and makes noise and uh, destroys it. But therefore, the screening uh, is the first step. It says, is this project, now fixing the sign, um, causing a significant effect on the protected feature? So we don't look now on the rock, we look on the protected feature, which I introduced you before. Normally, fixing the sign would not cause any problem, and therefore there is no problem. Now, let's go further. Uh, let's imagine we would like to open this cave um, to a touristic, or just to the, to the, to the public. Uh, in principle, from this aspect, 
you might not immediately say that it could cause an effect, but um, in the assessment phase, um, it would come maybe to the conclusion that after a certain number of people going into this cave, the effect is too high, which would cause a negative effect. Because of this, if I just go now in my logical order, uh, this project is not possible as such. Now I have to assess alternatives. And the alternative would be, I would limit uh, the number of people going to this cave, or I go even further now, uh, this um, opening of the cave can only be done by a guard who is experienced and also will guide the people through the cave. Now with this condition, the proponent of this idea opening the cave might get the allowance that under these certain conditions, uh, the, the protected feature cannot be disturbed and or not significantly harmed. Now um, we go in the next step and now I'm switching to this article 6.4. There might be situations where it's impossible to um, uh, redesign the project that it cannot harm the feature. So let's go back, for example, to my um, highway, which, which I mentioned. Um, there is a clear need because of uh, um, connection between two cities that the highway between city A and B has to be built. Now, when this happens rather often, there is a river going through this, um, this area, which means whatever alternative I would go, my highway has to go over, over the river. And the assessment said, for example, and this happened um, right off in Germany, that the bridge caused a significant, significant effect on the Natur 2000 side, which is the river or the alluvial forest growing there. So now, as there are no alternatives, uh, the authority has to prove that there's an overriding public interest of the project. So option one. Second um, is, this can also happen, is the project needed uh, for human health, public safety? Could be, for example, that um, uh, a forest has to be um, managed, which um, protects a city um, near a mountain. Um, and if this is confirmed, so there is no alternative, the project is of overriding public interest, then an allowance can still be given under the condition that the damage which is caused is compensated by the authority. And here there are two ways. If the protected feature is a priority habitat type, or a priority species, the European Commission has to publish an opinion. So it's a rather formal procedure. If it is another protected feature, um, the European Commission has to be informed about the compensation measures and that there are no alternatives and that the overriding public interest is confirmed. So it can happen that even a rather important protected site needs or has to be destroyed partly because of the overriding public interest. But then this compensation is now really has to compensate what was destroyed. So it's not sufficient that somebody pays a certain sum of money into a fund. It's not sufficient that if uh, Alluvial forest was destroyed. The authority is uh, is planting a flower-rich grassland. So it must exactly what was destroyed, and it can happen. This is also uh, a case which I've seen in my experience that a certain habitat type cannot be compensated at all because it takes too long. Um, 
that this habitat type is reestablished, or it's even impossible because there is nothing else which can be uh, taken from, from the area which is around. By saying this, a compensation measure is nothing which has to be done anyway. And now if you remember back to my previous slide about management of natural resources, where there was Article 6.1, which means uh, you have to uh, bring the features in a, in a good conservation status. So it's not sufficient just to do something nice or good or positive for something which is already protected because there's a legal obligation anyway. So it must be something additionally. A new designation of a new natural resource site might rather often be part of this compensation package because you destroyed something. And let's, let's go back to my example with the highway. You put asphalt or beton into a protected site. So this part is totally gone, which means it's appropriate now that the member state uh, finds a new area um, to extend the Natura 2000 network. So what is the scope of this conversation measure as well? As I already mentioned, um, it should uh, compensate what was destroyed. It must be full ecological uh, working. I give you, again, a rather simple uh, um, example. Let's imagine that a uh, protected site with beach forest, 100 years old beach forest, was partly destroyed. It's not a compensation measure to plant baby trees uh, somewhere else because that's not a forest. That's, well, maybe it's grassland, but for sure not a beach forest. And therefore, it's still ecologically not working, and therefore, it would not be sufficient. Um, I'm, we are rather often asked, how often does this happen? So now, if you think about, we have 27,000 natural disaster sites in Europe. And if you remember, any plan or project has to be assessed. And the likelihood might be rather high, uh, maybe also from your experience, that the project might harm a natural disaster site. Well, in my next slide, which is the last one, I gave you a screenshot which is, which is publicly available on our homepage. How many projects required a commission opinion since the year 2000? I'm sorry for the size of the uh, slide, but maybe it's the maximum of 20 in, since the year 2000. And I would say, I didn't count it now, 80% are from Germany. Um, so you see that in that the Article 6.3, 6.4 methodology works perfectly well because the number of projects which might destroy Natura 2000 areas under the condition of overriding public interest and there is no alternative is really, really, really small. And those projects which are submitted to the commission, um, we assess rather carefully and mostly we found um, an, a solution which uh, helped both the nature uh, which has to be protected, but also that the project has to run because certain conditions like deepening a river that ships, which are also now getting bigger and bigger, can go through a river. Uh, well, there is no alternative than deepening the river. But if this is needed, and if this is so important for the member states, we really look carefully that the conversation measures are properly done. And there is no cost limit uh, because the directive doesn't say um, that there is a certain limit uh, for a conversation measure. So I hope that with this overview, I could give you a, a kind of uh, guidance that um, the nature directives of Europe um, are able to protect um, the protected features, but also give the possibility 
to economic or uh, safety needs uh, for certain projects. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your uh, interesting presentation. We are a little bit ahead of time, but I don't know if uh, the next speaker is already ready. So uh, the next speaker will be uh, Ursula Schäfer from the Friends of the Earth uh, Germany, which is B U N D, and uh, she is actually uh, talking about the gypsum extraction and uh, eventually replacing uh, this. Are you there? Yeah. Yes, I am. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. Well, <laughs> so um, no. this should be my presentation. Is it visible? Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah, so thank you very much for the invitation. Um, yeah, I work for Friends of the Earth Germany. And since I first visited the Southern Hearts gypsum area, I at the same time was um, involved into uh, gypsum mining and extraction. And so um, I learned to find out about alternatives to the extraction and consumption of natural gypsum in Germany. Well, first is a small overview once again about the gypsum cast in the South Hearts area. Um, it's um, built up by the unique confluence of surface gypsum and many hard streams. In the picture, it's um, part of the gypsum cast of uh, Thuringia. And you have a view north, and you can see um, on the left, um, there is a small stream coming down. We have a lot of um, cast, uh, a lot of hard streams, and um, they um, come up to these um, gypsum hills, and thus it's creating about a 100 kilometer belt of green cast. So that's very special. That is the cast with natural deciduous forests. And um, in the South Hearts, it's dominated by beach, that is Fagels Zivatica. And all the forests um, in the gypsum cast are FFR, that is flora, fauna, habitat, forest types. And in between these forests, you see um, green meadows and they still have a very high biodiversity, as you see here. That's also gypsum cast in Thuringia. And there is a very low input um, up to now of fertilizers and it's an extensive use. So we have still meadows with lots of rare flowers. It's just very beautiful to see. So that's the problem. We have um, quite a lot of um, um, problems in, in all over the world. And one of um, the big problems is the global run on primary minerals. Uh, and in the South Hearts, um, it's um, only in open pits or open quarries. And it's not only gypsum, but as well dolomite, sand and gravel. So that's um, also to, uh, to Turingia one of the biggest gypsum quarries. Um, we have um, about a, a thousand hectares um, of uh, gypsum quarries in the South Hearts gypsum cast, just in the two uh, states of Lower Saxony and uh, Thuringia. 
Um, and about 90% of these quarries is a natural beech forest. We have right now about 2000 hectares gypsum, so-called gypsum priority areas, where in, uh, in the future there will be um, permission to new um, gypsum quarries. So that's far too much. Yeah, and I give you some numbers once again for the area of the South Heart gypsum. We have only in um, Lower Saxony and Thuringia, we have about um, 5,700,000 hectares of um, Natura 2000 um, gypsum cast areas. Um, but if you have a closer look, um, you see it's only one third of that protected areas covered with surface gypsum. Um, the other uh, two thirds are covered with dolomite or um, residues of um, um, yeah of of remains from erosion, like in the valleys you have clay. Um, once again, yeah, we have about 1,000 hectares of gypsum in open pits already. And um, as we heard before, in a hotspot of biodiversity. And that um, hotspot is not sort of uh, protection. We have only the protection by Natura 2000. And about 900 hectares open gypsum pits are in natural forests. And you have the clear cut, you have the loss of forest soils and it's a high uh, setting free of carbon dioxide and nitric oxide. So why do we need so many uh, open quarries um, in the gypsum cast? Um, what is it used for? 90% of the German gypsum products, right now it's ni about 9 million tons per year, are used for building construction only but you don't need any gypsum to build houses. So I give you some more numbers. The total gypsum demand in Germany is about 10 million. And um, right now we have um, still the so-called rear gypsum, that is a gypsum um, from uh, desulfurization of uh, charcoal power plants. Um, and 40% is natural gypsum, and right half of that comes from the uh, gypsum cast in the South Hearts. But we have, thereof, we have about 2 million tons per year as export, either raw gypsum or products. And um, you can see the the whole 9 million tons per year that go into building materials Half of it is only for these very cheap plaster boards. Um, we have some need for gypsum for cement, 1.7 million per year, and 2.3 uh, million tons per year is um, used for plaster and street. Uh, that means for walls and floors. But before we had this rear gypsum, like before the year of 2000, the German gypsum demand was only about uh, 5 million tons per year. That says it was just half of that. So that's gypsum demand is the demand of international companies um, that um, have their, um, their production, um, their factories in Germany. So also it's um, for export partly. So what did Friends of the Earth do? Um, we did a lot of investigation on alternatives um, to save the gypsum cast. Um, study one is um, about um, yeah, green alternatives um, to extraction of natural gypsum um, by a bureau called Alvast Consulting in Berlin. And um, he did quite a good work on finding out the amount of natural gypsum uh, that is um, from Germany, the amount of um, possible recycling of gypsum, and the amount of so-called secondary gypsum that would be um, like uh, rare gypsum, like um, gypsum from uh, chemical and technical 
production. So you have a by in by as byproduct you have um, secondary gypsum. So Mr. Alvast um, figured out in the study, um, like um, he shows that you can really exit natural gypsum within the next 20 years, we hope, um, by just changing the way you um, live and you produce um, yeah, building materials. So um, this would be about what we use right now, about nine or 10 million tons per year. Um, and this curve and the three gray curves are these three um, products I mentioned before. The highest amount is used just for these plasterboards. Um, the black is used for street and plaster and the light gray shows you um, gypsum used for cement. And this blue shows um, the part, the section for rear gypsum right now. The yellow is um, the natural gypsum. And we have very, very few, that's orange, very few um, recycling gypsum. Um, Mr. Albers said we um, should go down with our uh, consumption. That means we shouldn't um, break down houses, but we could just reuse houses. And the same with the materials. We should just reuse materials and um, before we <laughs> recycle them. So you can drop down in the curve very well. And um, he investigated on recycling. Um, that is already done with um, public um, organizations in Germany, federal organizations that say the same. We can come up with about much more of recycling gypsum if we try hard. And we um, could also use much more of the secondary gypsum, which is, which is um, gray here. Um, so I come to the point where we just change our habits that's shown here. Um, we have a very high variety in boards made of fibers in Germany. They are already on the market. Um, you can use either straw or wood or hemp. And we have proof from some companies um, that the costs uh, straw board plus installation, like um, the working hours, um, is just about the same than uh, the price for plasterboard and its installation. Um, yeah, and they are already um, to find in the internet and also in constructions, but it's not so well known up to now. You can um, use um, wood boards as well. You have also lightweight panels where you can um, use leftover woods. Um, Hemp is also very good um, for these panels. There are certain um, applications where you can use um, plant fibers. That is for bigger buildings where you use um, wooden um, constructions. So you need fireproof boards, but therefore you could use, instead of gypsum, you can use clay, which usually is um, taken out of um, pits that are uh, already for other purposes like um, uh, flat retaining basins um, or um, other constructions. Um, you can use cement boards, but because it's a high global warming uh, potential within cement, uh, you can use recycling cement. With, there you have a lot of good investigations and um, practical um, use already. In future, we could also use um, waste <laughs> in Germany. Um, that is um, aerated concrete that's used for um, bricks, for stones, for house building. Uh, that's a very light sort of concrete. Um, people don't use that after they broke down houses. So we have a waste of about 2.4 million tons per year. Nobody uses that anymore. And there are investigations on 
recycling that material, which would save us about um, 25% of the annual gypsum uh, consumption in Germany. And Germany consumes uh, quite a lot of gypsum, much more than all other European countries. Um, yeah, the second is we have a lot of studies right in uh, the South Hearts. Um, it's um, the cooperation of um, the University of Nordhausen, uh, the University of Weimar, and an Institute of Applied Construction Physics in Weimar. And they have about 10 different projects going um, ongoing about uh, gypsum and replacing natural gypsum by different um, um, by different materials. So this we had before, we could save 25% um, of plasterboard using concrete boards, um, recycled concrete boards. Yeah, they have some more investigations also on regrowing raw materials, on secondary minerals. And um, here it's one interesting thing. We have um, fertilizer production of potassium. That's in the South Hearts area, and they try to extract gypsum. And the general recycling of building material, um, and it's containing gypsum, uh, could come up to 15% of the annual amount that is right now in consumption. Yeah, we have <laughs> coming closer to today, uh, 2021, a very interesting study um, on behalf of the Green Party um, with a um, German Montan technology um, company. And um, here you see a very big gypsum pit in Thuringia. And um, they had investigations on secondary gypsum from uh, phosphor vertila phosphorus fertilizer. So here is one graphic from that investigation. So that's really interesting um, because it could help maybe all over Europe and all over the world to stop this high amount of primary mineral consumption with gypsum and using substitutes like this um, phosphor gypsum that is a byproduct from phosphor fertilizer production. Um, you can see the investigation on very many countries, countries of the European Union. For example, Poland, this village Police is about 150 kilometers from Berlin and has a railway um, connection to Berlin. So that's just half as far as the South Hearts gyps uh, gypsum cast. <laughs> and they produce every year about 2.5 million tons of phosphor gypsum. But up to now, from all these places where you have a high amount of gypsum, uh, of phosphor gypsum, it's only Angus and Belgium where it's recycled 100%. That's uh, the company called Knauf, um, our biggest company dealing with natural gypsum. Um, why is it? It's because it's quite too expensive for the companies, or not too expensive, but it's more expensive than digging for primary gypsum. So they have to clean the byproduct, especially from um, the acid that uh, destroys, uh, if you use it as plaster, it, is, it destroys the, it, it destructs the, um, those um, metal poles in the, in the houses, the tubes for water and so on. Um, yeah, this is a, Last research now on secondary materials, secondary gypsum, that's quite interesting because the University of Freiberg right now is um, in a research where they, 
try not only to gain phosphor gypsum from these tailings, um, but that yeah, a lot of people, universities and companies figured out that the phosphor gypsum tailings contain a high amount of rare earth elements. And rare earth elements for our green energy are quite very high in price. So if you extract rare earth elements of the out of the um, tailings of phosphor gypsum, you will gain a lot of money. And at the same time, with the rare earth element extraction, you take out the um, radioactivity, which is partly in these tailings. It's no high radioactivity. It's a natural ra radioactivity from phosphorus rocks. But it, the gypsum companies say it's um, a problem to gypsum for construction. So they can take out rare earth elements and radioactive elements as well. They have about the same radius, atomic radius. And so they get very clean phosphor gypsum for practical use in buildings. So because you have those gypsum tailings, uh, so those phosphor gypsum tailings all over the world, um, that would really replace most of the and can replace most of the primary minerals. So here's a second study in the United States and I put the links um, down here as well so you can just read it. Yeah, Friends of the Earth and 59 other NGOs pu just published a paper that says we have really to decrease primary resource consumption. So all of us can um, contribute to that. And politics are really um, asked to do so. And we have to just to have a big change, a transformation um, for our uh, consumption. So um, within this paper, um, there's some very interesting um, there are some very interesting um, sayings. I came to that at the end. Um, yeah, the the NGOs suggest just beside the the usual European um, waste uh, management, um, the NGOs suggest you should um, just preserve your building stock, so you really don't need new uh, materials. You should reuse and renovate um, houses and materials. If you can't really reuse things anymore, you should at least recycle things. And that means um, dealing with building construction and building materials, you should shred the products and try to get new products out of it. Um, these last parts, if you try to have a, a recycling, the material recovery or an elimination, they are not that, um, not <laughs> the um, things we want to, to have with consumption. We would like to stay here in preserving and reusing, renovating. If you really have to recycle, it starts to get high in energy and um, um, use of machines. So there are some rules for building materials. If you really um, build materials, they should be separable um, and they should be toxic free they, so that you can reuse and recycle. And mainly you should use the secondary minerals or regrowing materials. So I come back to the, um, the NGOs and what they say. Um, in the gypsum cast, we we will never have a change from the companies digging um, if we don't prevent new pits in the gypsum cast because everything is um, more expensive than digging and mining for primary gypsum. So the NGOs say it's still they say the reasons it's still significantly cheaper. Um, and um, it's sort of quasi subsidized by uh, government, by the way of production fees, low water abstra abstraction fees and low energy and electricity taxes. So companies will never change if we don't 
prevent new pits for primary gypsum. So we want that there are more taxes on primary minerals, taxes on clear cutting, on destruction of soils, on destruction of bio and geodiversity. And just that would be the way that we really come to practice circular economy. So in the end, we should just look at nature because nature doesn't have any waste. Nature recycles everything and we should just do the same. And with that, we have to think connected. We should work connected like you do. And I hope we stay connected. So thank you for listening. Thank you uh, very much, Ursula, for this interesting uh, presentation on uh, recycling uh, and uh, using other products and techniques uh, instead of, of uh, natural uh, gypsum. So uh, this uh, second part of uh, today is uh, actually now uh, closed, uh, as we only had uh, three presentations. Uh, and uh, I would like to invite you for the tomorrow's uh, presentations on the Gipskast in Deutschland, which will be in German language. And it will start again on here on this channel at 10 o'clock uh, when Werbel Vogel, uh, the president of the German uh, Biological Federation will open the, the second day. So thank you uh, very much, uh, everybody. This uh, presentations will stay online uh, for the future. So uh, everybody, can still have a look uh, on what we have uh, presented.